just about six o'clock. Good morning. Happy Friday from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I'm Robert Walsh. A couple of players signed yesterday ahead of free agency, most notably Patriots signing uh, former Steelers offensive tackle Chooks Akora for Rams re-signing one of the better guards in the market, Kevin Dodson, to a three-year $48 million deal. T- uh, Dolphins signed former Titans tight end Jonu Smith, two-year $10 million deal for him. And the first franchise taggee signing a long-term extension, Jalen Johnson, headed back to Chicago on a four-year $76 million deal, averaging about 19 a year, the ninth highest quarterback contract on average, which will look like a bargain once these next cornerback deals get done. And last night, Nashville SC and Inter Miami ends in a 2-2 tie. The teams will meet Wednesday night in Miami for the second leg of the home-and-home portion of the round of 16, with Miami holding a decisive edge thanks to the away goals rule. Before the match, Nashville SC announced a contract extension for their midfielder, Hani Mukhtar, keeping the 2022 MLS MVP and Golden Boot winner with the club through 2026 uh, also as an option for 2027 for the two-time All-Star, who is also the club's all-time leader in goals, assists, and points. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Balls. This is 104.5 The Zone. A very happy Friday wherever you are in Middle Tennessee and around the world. We have one thing in common this morning. We're all celebrating a Friday. Welcome yeah. into RKW, brewed by 8th and Rose, Ramon, Kayla, and Will with Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Robert Walsh, making the show happen. My name is Will Bowling. We've got Brent Hubs of All Quest for his weekly 720 visit here on this beautiful Friday. Andy Staples of On3 discusses a college football super league of which he wrote on On3.com this week. We've got players the Titans should avoid, whether it's in free agency, the draft, or just walking down the streets in Asheville. 615-737-1045 is our number. It is Friday, and ladies and gentlemen, we plan on acting like it. Friday, good people. Welcome mm-hmm. to the last day of the week. I swear, like I want to hear this song every day, but <laughs> just it's it makes it more special. It does. Friday, it you know? does make it special for a Friday. I'm here for that. I am absolutely here for that. A uh, quick ask from the studio: Can anybody tell me what time it is, Ramon? Can anybody tell me what time it is? Yeah, it's six oh three. Oh, could you just hold that big ass watch up to the camera? Who are you flexing on today, Nobody. man? Absolutely. Oh, no sorry, one. sorry if I hit a wrong button because Ramon's large watch is glaring back into the studio and uh, impairing my vision. You know that thing is massive. <laughs> you know what? I had to wear it today because I hadn't worn it in a very long time. And the last time I put it on, the hand wasn't moving because you Ooh. have to. It's uh, was the Swiss movement or whatever. Yeah. So you have to actually like move it for the mechanism you have to, to charge wear it themselves. To, yeah. Yes, exactly. So that's why. Oh, vertebrae. okay. He's he's yeah. He's getting it awakened. <laughs> what's the what's the chance you would let me flex with that for a little bit? Take a couple pics. You know what I mean? It's already off my wrist. Oh, <laughs> don't play with me. Uh, I don't want to put that thing off on. my wrist. Man. I don't I'm gonna put... bring it back down the break for you. You're okay? gonna you gonna make me. Uh, <laughs> Accustomed to the high life, man. I can't deal with that. You won't be a basic man no more. <laughs> <laughs> Have fun with that, man. He could be doing his like bicep workouts back there with that uh, thing. Know, I'm telling you. Damn. Honest, it's, uh, it's different. It's different. That's all I say. That's I'm, what they used to call Ramon, strong wrist foster. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's He's got a, a group. Thing. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it is Friday and you are acting it's like it's like 603, the, baby. The meme of the guy, the rapper who takes his chain off. 
and then he gives it to his buddy, and yeah. he's just like, you know, like, hey, <laughs> Training hey, day. gang, gang, come gang, on. Gang. <laughs> <laughs> come on. Yeah, I hate Bert, man, because Bert, I tried Bert's to hide. Bert's up at six again. This he is two is. days in a row. This, this is good stuff, man. I'm proud of you, Bert. Ah, oh, I was glad to see everybody's acting like it, man. That 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 woke, that woke me up. I'm going to be honest with you. I was, had, I was dragging cheeks this morning, okay? I don't know why. You know, I just have those mornings. That's where I was. Uh-huh. But I appreciate y'all getting me up. That's what we do. That's what we do. We're definitely up at this, what, 6.05 now. 6.05 okay. now. Yeah. And I can tell time on this one. It's not blinded by diamonds. That like is nice people, looking, though. Typically what watches are for. I, you, you know what's crazy is I've seen more people now just have a plain Jane. Instead of like when you put diamonds in watches, it actually takes the, the true value away because those diamonds are so small they put in, they have no value. So it's like, do away with those. You're chipping away at the actual real material. So what matters the most on a watch? Uh, the structure of it, number one. The brand, number two. And um, I would just say the prestige of it also matters. But the if you're adding diamonds, faster. if you're adding diamonds to a watch, you're taking away from the value. Uh, yeah, unless those diamonds come from the factory. That. There are such things as like Rolex diamonds, and when it comes down to you adding secondary market diamonds, you actually devalue it a lot, although they charge you probably three times as much for it. Damn. I fell victim to that, too, in my early years in the NFL. It, did. it was yeah, weird. I'm uh, sure. Following the trend, trying to get a big watch or all the diamonds and stuff is crazy. It's childish is what it is. Just stick with my Apple Watch. Be perfectly fine. And that's the issue, too. Is uh, the Apple Watch? Mm-hmm. I wear it often. Mm-hmm. If I'm taking steps, I'm better. I better get credit for it. If I'm working right. out, that's right. <laughs> it don't count unless the Apple Watch says it. I can't remember the last time I worked out without my Apple Watch. Really? I've gone into the gym and my watch would be dead, and I'd just be looking around like, "What am I doing here?" You're like, "What is this for then? What did <laughs> I just do this whole workout for?" Straight up, <laughs> I need to know I burned at least 800 calories right now. So I, I meant to bring this up yesterday on the topic of Tennessee, South Carolina, before we go into the weekend and our question of the morning this morning, because I love listening to Tom Hart and Jimmy Dykes call a basketball game. Who is your favorite play-by-play broadcaster and color analyst in sports right now? Uh, play-by-play and color analyst. Um, it would have to be, I think Charles Davis is solid. It's because I like his his tone, the way he goes about it. Absolutely love it. Play by play would absolutely be listening to Mike Keith. Yeah. Yeah. Easy answer. Yeah. Yeah, easy answer. Yeah, it was. Easy answer. Plus, you Definitely. get a front row seat at the master class that is Mike Keith and Titans Radio. This it's year. more mm-hmm. than just talking. 100%. It's so much more than just talking. It is. And I realize that and do not take it for granted. Um, there's a level of painting pictures that you have to be able to have the ability to do and just to break down the knowledge and and also the reach back in history yeah. that they do often. I enjoyed that type of commentating right there. When they can drop those historical nuggets, nuggets and stuff, I'm a fan. I love Kevin Burkhart and Greg Olson, and I know that that crew will be broken up um, because Tom Brady's going to come into the fold. But uh, I just, knowing that you take two huge names away and bring them to ESPN and – That's always hard to replace sometimes, especially in the NFL in terms of the caliber of name that you have. But I feel like Kevin Burkhart, first of all, I love him on doing whatever, baseball, football. Um, And Greg Golson, I'm a little skeptical of players sometimes that go directly into the NFL. And they're given that job and it's like, you know, everybody thinks that right away they're going to be great. And I think he actually proved like he was really good at that job. And I, I thought the broadcast with those two together was uh, pretty seamless. I agree with you on that one. Bert? I, I, I like him, too. Yeah. I'm a huge Adam Amin fan. I think he just mm-hmm. makes the game very accessible, whether he's calling baseball, basketball, whatever he's calling. He makes it feel like you're you're listening to your buddy describe something through a phone. Like, I love Adam Amin. Also, Mike Keith is a layup, dude. Yeah. He as is. far as it comes with radio voices, that guy is a... a Daniel Jeremiah is also really good with the Chargers on radio. Yeah, he's good at everything. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, people don't realize, I think, outside of L.A., that he is the color analyst for L.A. Chargers radio. I oh, didn't straight know up? Until recently. Daniel Jeremiah, yeah. He, he, uh, there's just another TV personality I like that grew on me more. I'll be honest with you. I didn't know how it was going to smooth itself over. Charles Barkley he's on great. TV in general. I think is superb when you look at his truthfulness, how he goes about it. He doesn't switch up. I think that's what makes the good ones great 
is they just do their style. Mm -hmm. And that is where I think Charles Barkley has grown on me more and more if you watch him on podcasts, when he does the TNT stuff. It's not play-by-play or anything. No. But just overall TV, Barkley's done it for me, man, on the halftime crew that they have. He's a realist. Yeah, he is. I like him. And he don't switch up from himself. No. Is it easier for you to pick a favorite or a least favorite? Oof. Uh, anything with Carl Ravitch is a least favorite for me. Everyone's going to say Tony Romo. Ugh. I was thinking. Because that's the trendy pick right now. But yeah. for me, play-by-play wise, I can't pick just one. And that's a cop-out answer. But I have like a favorite for each sport. Like I love Jim Nance over everything because I think Jim Nance is one of the people that I've looked up to in this business forever. Um, but then in baseball, I love Joe Davis who went from, uh, you know, Southern league broadcaster to the LA Dodgers to now doing like main Fox games. Joe Buck does not get enough love for how good he is. And then color, color analyst wise, I think Greg Olson's a great pick, but Jimmy Dykes is outstanding. And that that's what made me think about this the other day too, is that I think he can communicate things in a way that just makes so much sense and you're not being talked over, but it's also humble and it's entertaining. Mm-hmm. That's the thing that I think sports media has an issue with right now is the fact that so many people in sports media don't even like the sports that they cover and don't even want to advance the game in a way that is entertaining to people. Marcellus in the FN and Bank chat on YouTube says, only Will would ask this question. I think it's fair. Buck was asking it actually on the show two days ago, too, have, have which also heard, made me think of it. You, you realize how important those dudes are, too? I'm just curious, too, yeah. because I, I think guys like Tom Hart and Jimmy Dykes are so good. And then I just got done watching another CONCACAF Champions Cup night last night where you have a single broadcaster on FS2. FS2, mm-hmm. not FS1, for Miami and Lionel Messi. And it's one guy. And I am less inclined if I was not a Nashville SC person to watch that game because it's one person on the call and no disrespect to Mike Watts who does a good job on the call. This is not a commentary on him, but like solo call like that on like a secondary channel for a massive game like that between Tom Hart and Jimmy Dykes, who I think are my favorite college broadcasters right now. And then that it just got me thinking a little bit. That. No, I was just going to say, I, I want to give a shout out to women. And I am I'm I know there's not a lot of play-by-play it's not, um, it's gals not. In, in radio and on TV in that aspect. And it's a hard thing to do. And especially if you necessarily did not play the game and you're you're kind of doing that, mm-hmm. I think that's difficult. But what, what I will say, and I've been watching her for the past three years grow as a broadcaster, is Andrea Carter is phenomenal. And I think she could do... Play-by-play, I think she could do color. She's obviously a host and does all the things right now at ESPN for men's and women's basketball. Um, She's also on college game day for uh, basketball on Saturdays. She's like an analyst. That gal is so not only knowledgeable because she played the game, and I know she wasn't a star at Tennessee, but she's so knowledgeable. But the way she delivers is second to none. Like the her delivery is like I want to listen to her. Yeah, I've heard of you know, her. You know, I, I don't know what it is about it, but she's so knowledgeable but yet comes across as personable. Yeah. So I wanted to give her a shout out just cuz I think she could do anything. And, and two other guys too cuz they're super crucial to me. I l- love listening to Iron Eagle's voice. Mhm. I do and I know some people are back and forth on Kirk Herb Street, but I Kirk, like Kirk is a I respect his work ethic. Yeah. And and his drive to be great almost more than anything yep. too. So Kirk is he gets a tip of the he- uh, cap for me. I agree for sure. That's a good one over Desmond for sure. For sure, hundred yeah. percent. Most underrated outside of um, or most underrated for me outside of the business because I think people in the business love him is Dan Shulman. Dan Shulman, and it is not even close. He is outstanding, and Kevin Harlan too. The other one again, I'm yeah. totally gonna cop out and just name like ten people. Because I watch way too much live sports and I love the business of play by play. And maybe it is a question I would only think of, and that's okay. But anyway, that's our question of the day. 615 737 1045 is our number. Uh, coming up, it was an event last night at Geodis Park. And I'll be honest with you, Nashville SC got robbed by Lionel Messi. We'll talk about it next.
Hey, it's Kayla Anderson with QC Kinetics. It is that time of year to enjoy life. Heck, any time of year is a great year to enjoy life. Stop letting that pain in your joints keep you from doing what you love to do this spring. Call QC Kinetics now. QC Kinetics is the nation's leader in regenerative medicine. And we're talking about long-lasting relief from that joint pain. No surgery, no drugs, and no downtime. In fact, QC Kinetics is literally transforming lives. Their advanced treatments harness your own body's ability to restore and repair damaged joint tissue. You know, pro athletes have been doing this for decades, but now this life-changing treatment is available for you. No pain pills, no risky surgery. This is an all-natural solution. QC Kinetics has tens of thousands of satisfied patients who have reclaimed their mobility back. So why not be one of them and take action now? Live your best life this spring and summer. Call QC Kinetics. Get a free consultation. It's 615-249-4024. Call them at 615-249-4024. It's Ramon Foster for Wesley Mortgage. Man, I'm here to tell you right now, Wesley Mortgage is currently recruiting top mortgage talent. They are hiring, if you did not know also, they are the official mortgage providers of the Tennessee Titans and the Big Machine Music City Grand Prix. I'm here to tell you this, man. The owner, Chuck Medow, is a local Nashville native. If you've ran into Chuck and talked to Chuck, you know that to be true. He cares about this community and always proud to serve him and always just proud to just sit back and talk to you, okay? Chuck reinvests in the people and the places that make Nashville such a great place. While other mortgage companies are downsizing, Chuck McDowell and the Wesley Mortgage team are rapidly expanding in Nashville, keeping people working in a career they love, and they would love to have you join their team. I'm telling you, if you want to be Nashville and be around Nashville, Chuck McDowell and the Wesley team are a, a group that will keep you in it and keep it local and keep it native. Simply visit whywesley.com to join the team.
Friday morning, on her bone, Kayla and Will, RKW is brewed by Eighth and Rose. Tramone Foster, Kayla Anderson, Will Bowling with you. Question of the day on Twitter, at Ramon Kayla Will. Who is your favorite play-by-play and or color analyst in broadcasting right now? Don writes in and says, give me RG3 in football, then pair him with Kevin Harlan. Basketball got to be Jimmy Dykes and Avery Johnson, he says. Mm. Uh, Avery I, Johnson. I respectfully am not a huge RG3 fan. Yeah, I think sometimes he does a little too much. Way too much. And he's trying to be Romo 2.0. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Him like, and Mark Sanchez, I think, oh pushed the line just a little bit. I yeah. can't remember hearing Sanchez. He's on CBS. You is would he? know. Yeah. He's Fox. You would know. I said, oh, he's Fox. Sorry. Okay. He's Fox. NFL I, Fox. I, I can't remember hearing Sanchez. That's, that's, that's fascinating right there. All I think of when I hear of Sanchez is failed quarterback from USC and butt fumble. <laughs> Those butt are the fumble. two things. But I can't believe the butt fumble followed him for that long. I, I know, but it's like, what else did he do? I he gets such a bad rap. He went to two AFC championships back to back his rookie and sophomore year in the NFL. Like, Damn. I think the Jets just sucked and ruined him. I don't think it was Sanchez <laughs> as much as it was the Jets. And the legend of Rex Ryan, I think, took over the entire. Like, they turned into a very respectable, like, hard hitting, like, tough yeah. winning football team. And then it became, as Bert just said a second, a circus. It really did become a circus, I feel like, up there. Because they had everything you needed, man. Left tackle to Rickshaw Ferguson was there. I mean, let's, they had some dudes up there, man. And they dropped the ball. It's so, yeah. funny. Mark Sanchez gets offended about the butt fumble. I know. Of course he does. He went on Pardon My Take on Barstool Sports Podcast a month ago. It was like, well, like, you know, technically. Oh, God. Yeah. Give me a break, dude. I don't hate him. I just, he annoys me. Yeah, I feel you on that one. I feel you on that one. Uh, I I never heard him uh, call a game though. Yeah. You if you if you had you would know, for sure. Is he over the top? Yeah, he, he just oh. makes a, t- a, a ton of jokes. He's done some Titans games recently too. I he have is. to be careful too talking about other broadcasters because Lord knows I have have never had a perfect game and probably never will. And but uh, that is one that I will step out there and be like, yeah, not my favorite. Not my favorite. Yeah. Uh, Jim writes it on Twitter at Ramon Kayla Will. Robbie Hummel. Very good. I completely agree. That guy is a rising star. Former Purdue basketball player. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only Purdue basketball player that I'm a fan of. I don't even I don't know, know if I've heard like that. Yeah. Oh, he, you, you probably have. He did. Um, oh, he did an early season Tennessee game. I want to say last year. Who was Tennessee's big non-conference game at home last year? It was. Um, Oh, my gosh. That's going to bother me. But whoever that was, he did that game. It was like a narrow Tennessee win. I want to say he did Tennessee-Auburn a couple years ago, too. Gonzaga. No, we didn't play Gonzaga last year, did we? No, that was two years ago, I think. Shoot. Yeah, I'll figure it out. But Yeah, but he's solid, though? Yeah, very what good. What makes him different? Why, why is he he's Just underrated? really smart. Super, super smart. Really smart. Calling. Okay. I like guys who are really smart but don't make you feel dumb for not being as smart as they are. You know who surprised me? Uh, I listened to him call call out stuff was Ron Slay. Yes. Oh, and, Slay's uh, excellent. Play by I know. Uh, uh, I, sorry, color. Yeah, color. I just yeah. never heard him being his zone and element like yeah. that. And I, and I was even more impressed in his high school calling he did was Lucas this past year. Yeah, that's right. He called out a play before it even developed, and I was just and Lucas was like, "Whoa!" Like he's like, "And this is gonna happen. That's gonna happen. And then he's gonna make the layup." And, and like happens. a half a second later, the exact same thing happened. Like. I, I admire people that dive into their sport like that and just can call it and be knowledgeable about it. That was uh, that was refreshing for me on that one. Yeah, I heard him on the Auburn call last year. Yeah, with I think it was Tom Hart actually. He was with that was. was that was fun. I mean, they could barely even hear what's around him. On top of that, that's always difficult because of the screaming lady. Well, but specifically, oh yes. god, because it's right behind him. <laughs> I, I cannot watch a game at Auburn Lord. with with the sound on unless it's like golly with Ugh. the screaming lady. I need her to graduate. <laughs> Corey in Hendersonville, first up on the phones this morning. What's up, Corey? What's up, Corey? Not much. And I apologize if I'd have heard y'all say that you know, y'all wanted submissions on Twitter. I would have just did it on Twitter. That's all right. But, um, so I got a couple of different ones for different sports, if you don't mind. Um, yep. Somebody said Kevin Harlan, and I absolutely love Kevin Harlan. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at the world of professional wrestling and MMA, Mauro Ronaldo is extremely good. Mm. I don't know if you've ever heard him okay. call like Mama a Mia. Match. 
Is that what he does, um, Bart? Something similar to that, yeah, man. Um, Wasn't good enough for her. It, <laughs> Corey, I guess. <laughs> hey, um, and then in baseball, because I'm a Braves fan, I always grew up listening to, like, uh, Skip Carey, Pete Van Weeren, mm-hmm. uh, and Chip Carey. And I know, I think Chip went from Atlanta to St. Louis. Yeah. But uh, he's still one of my favorite broadcasters. I'd say one of my least favorite is Eli Gold. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Corey. I appreciate it. It's, there's some good answers there on the good and bad. Side. What does Eli Gold do differently? Just different? Uh, I mean, he has the, the signature touchdown Alabama yeah. call. He's oh. no longer there, though. He's not. He is with the Nashville Cats. Uh-huh. Yeah, Chris Stewart, now the uh, the guy down there. Okay, for Eli sure. Eli Gold, now the, the, the Nashville, Cats. Nashville Cats. Beautiful. Uh, a lot of answers for Gus Johnson. Yeah. The one that, for me, was most instrumental outside of Mike Keith with the Titans, because that is what I have grown up listening to more than anything else, was Brad Nessler because of the NCAA football video game. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Genuinely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Again, I, I genuinely have like 20 that I that are all like tied for first. I wonder who's going well, to be the Well, tied for second behind Jim Nance. I wonder who's going to be the voice of NCA now moving forward. Chris Fowler. Yeah, Is they it? announced all that. He uh, actually posted a video yesterday saying, uh, I've spent the last week doing like playoff games, and wow. uh, it's him and Kirk. Uh, I forget who else. They put on there. I know David Pollock is yeah. back on there. Desmond Howard is on there. Uh, they basically got the whole game day crew. Uh, and then there's a rumor that you're going to be able to have two different broadcast teams huh. on there, which is now a thing in a lot of sports video games, like on FIFA now or EAFC. You can do that and have like just a random, you'll play one game and you'll have um, Derek Ray and Alan Smith and you'll play another game and it's not another crew. Okay, did not know that, man. I am mm-hmm. looking forward to it. Now, the more and more I think the closer we get, we get to this game, I'm actually looking forward to actually diving into it myself. My kid's going to be all over, and I can't wait to try to pick the balls too. So we'll see <laughs> if we win national championship in first year. Uh, Jason Benetti, a great answer from Tim in the FNM Bank Chat on YouTube. Uh, former voice of the White Sox, now Tigers, does football and basketball. He was on the UConn-Marquette game. That was on Fox the other night. That um, Watched the second half of that after Tennessee, South Carolina finished up. Jason Bonetti is tremendous. And by all accounts that I've heard, a very nice guy. Oh, for real? Very nice guy. I wish I knew these guys as, as good as y'all did because, like, to me, I would either just be, like, trying to watch to break down something or just in passing. And, like, when you – when I think they did the uh, experiment of not having a commentator – and it was terrible. Really? The game needs Ooh, it. Good. Yeah. I did, no, I'll keep going. <laughs> yeah. Shut up. I'll, I'll slide you a 10 if you keep saying that. <laughs> yeah, just, just we have a broadcaster in Seattle, and he also does national stuff for um, Sirius and stuff. Dave Sims. He's been there forever as the Mariners mm-hmm. um, play-by-play, and he's incredible. He's also, like, battled cancer and, like, come back from it. But he's actually nationally known, too, because he's from Philly. Yeah. So he's a, he got a start over on the East Coast, but has been up there with the Mariners for years. Sure. So Let's go to Lawrence in Clarksville, 615-737-1045. What's up, Lawrence? Hey, fellas. How y'all this morning? Good. Great. Good morning. Morning. Hey, I want to take y'all off track for a minute. I ain't going to be like the guy earlier in the week who suggested we should talk about this every day, like Vanderbilt women's basketball. <laughs> but I wanted to give my 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 guy, Corey Gibson, yeah. and the Austin P men's basketball team a shout-out. Uh, we won in the, the semifinals of the A-Sun tournament last night, going to the championship game on Sunday. Uh, he took a team that last year finished dead last in the conference and was uh, had become an embarrassment from what happened in the last game. Uh, our athletic director, shout out to him. Cheryl. He went back to our recent past, got Corey, who played and coached for us in P uh, about 15 years ago and had gone other places, brought him back and has restored uh, our team up here in Clarksville 
uh, to respectability and beyond uh, going to the championship game in, in one year. And, hey, if we went on Sunday, uh, give them a little shout-out on Monday for going to the NCAA tournament. But we appreciate you guys. All Thank you, Lawrence. To you. Appreciate the call. <laughs> Thanks, Lawrence. 77-71 last night. Big time, man, against the North Alabama Lions. Didn't you say North Alabama had a crazy finish to the game? Yes, they did. They beat yeah. Lipscomb on a buzzer Four. beater in Allen Reed. Ah, pretty Former wild. Lipscomb player K.J. Johnson with that buzzer beater. That's pretty wild, man. Uh, shout out to the athletic director, too, VFL himself, Gerald Harrison. That's also, right. mm-hmm. uh, I've said this recently in conversations with others. Austin Peay's had a big impression in marketing around the city, too. They got billboards everywhere. They've and always they, done a pretty good job with yeah. that. And they're beautifying uh, around that campus, too. So yeah. they're in a good era right now. Good space, man. I mean, it's the forward. best slogan, let's go pee. They're, I mean, <laughs> I, how, how do you beat that? I, I don't know how you beat that. It's what I say about 15 times a day. <laughs> yeah. I'm just giving them free marketing. Free marketing. <laughs> let's go pee. Govs, man. All right, I'm going to rant about Nashville SC for a couple minutes, then we'll get back to these calls. Can we hear All it, right. man? Two to two last night against Center Miami. If you were there, it was... Awesome. I was curious what the crowd would look like at 8 p.m. on a Thursday night versus a weekend. And it's not the first time he's been here. Sellout crowd announced. And for the second time, Lionel Messi was getting booed when he touched the ball. It was a pro Nashville crowd. It was electric last night. Luis Suarez scoring late in stoppage time. Nashville led this one 2-0. And they end up drawing 2-2. So the second leg of this tie will go back to Miami next Wednesday where essentially Miami has a a 2.5-2 lead is the easiest way I can describe it because the team with more away goals advances. So Nashville either has to win or to equal 2-2 or win uh, or or tie 3-3 or 4-4 or something like that, which will be very difficult to do down at Dry Pink Stadium. But... Nashville should have uh, should have had all three points, and they should have been playing against Inter Miami, likely with uh, two red cards, because you had two elbows, two faces of Nashville players. One was given as a yellow card, one was not even given as a foul. Uh, you had a penalty kick that likely should have been given to Nashville that Gary Smith talked about after the game. This very easily could have been a three nil Nashville win over a Miami team that likely could have had two players kicked out of the game. It was absolutely electric, and 2-2 is kind of a heartbreaker. But my goodness, it was so much fun. It was. That stadium was so much fun to be in last night. It sounded like it. Savage called me last night, and he was like, man, I forgot the soccer game. I guess traffic was insane getting over there as he was leaving out of the studio. It wasn't actually that that bad. On the highway, I'm guessing, is where he saw it. Maybe, yeah. Be active like that. Um, The crowd was there. The play was there. And they ruined it. That's terrible, Will. So, question to you, too, because everybody had their thoughts on paying a little bit more to see Messi. Um, how much gold was in the stands? Like, was it pretty much all? Very pro Nashville. Yeah. Very pro Nashville. Yep. A lot I of Barcelona shirts, a are... lot of Messi shirts, as always, but yeah. very pro Nashville. So, you said they got robbed. How did they get robbed? Where, where did it go wrong? So, if you go to my Twitter, go to the Ramon Kayla Will Twitter. I'll retweet it right okay. now from my twitter timeline last night from the show account and uh <laughs> the 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 elbow from uh redondo to jacob schaffelberg who scored two incredible goals like i mean incredible goals last night for nashville sc uh was given as a yellow card uh apple tv's taylor twelman former u.s soccer player immediately tweeted on twitter uh and said that's a red should have been a red. Should have been a red. Uh, Charles Bohm, respected soccer writer, said that's probably a red. Redondo should be in the showers. Um, <laughs> and, and then moments later, Jacob Schaffelberg got just cleaned out from behind with an elbow from a Miami player. <laughs> Nashville acquitted themselves very well in this game. And Nashville played just unbelievably well and announced an extension for Hani Mukhtar. Yeah, I heard that. For the game as well, through 2026 with an option for 2027. That's huge. Honey has been a huge part of this team, Ooh. as you know. He's been great. You're watching the video right now? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Will has it on his account, as he just said yeah. a second ago. That was right in front of the guy holding up the time snap. Is he is he an official? Well, yeah. So that that's actually not <laughs> even the one I'm talking about. But that, I just it's the one I just retweeted oh. from at Ramon Kayla Will's even worse. Yeah. 
And that one, uh, the one that you're talking about in front of the fourth official was not even given as a foul. Mm. Yeah. I, I yeah. see the one where you said red all day. Uh-huh. The little elbow check yeah. right there. Yeah, yeah. So does Miami, because of Messi and how they're trying to grow MLS even more here, do they get passes? Like, Is this a Jordan Rule situation? And this, I'm only uh, asking because I don't know this. Yes. It's a Jordan Rule. Nah. Pretty yeah. much. <laughs> this was not MLS. This was CONCACAF Champions Cup. So that's why I pause to answer carefully. But I do think there is an inherent bias towards the greatest player in the history of the sport and his team. Sure. I don't think any referee is sitting in a room saying, how do we rig this for Messi? Like, how do we get Messi through? But I think there is a certain star factor that when all things are equal, you give that guy the benefit of the doubt. Nashville also had a goal that was deemed offsides late late in the game as well that would have made it three to one at the time before Luis Suarez. And yes, that's the Luis Suarez who one time bit somebody while he was on the field and was suspended for quite some time. And that that's anyway, a separate discussion. Uh, and it was deemed offsides on a razor thin call. It was, it, there was a lot of drama. It was crazy. There were a lot of people yelling at each other. I mean, Nashville fans were hostile towards Miami fans and I loved every single second of it. Yeah, you want to awesome. always make this a difficult place to play, and I feel like it's been put on the map that it is that. I even was driving by the hotel where uh, Miami was staying, which I realized because there were people in Argentina and Messi shirts outside of it in front of two <laughs> huge buses with a motorcade in front of it. I rolled down my window and booed. I was, uh, I was I was asking, Bert, we speak about the Jordan rule. There's this iconic clip of this referee at the time. Um, Michael Jordan's trying to get a foul. And he's badgering the referee a little bit. And he's like, Michael, if you said it, I believe you. I believe you, Mike. And I apologize. <laughs> that, to me, is by far one of the biggest just anti-Jordan things I think you can have in those moments right there. Because people thought the Jordan rule is real. Uh, Robert Walsh has this clip. Yeah, it's wild to hear. Uh, Michael didn't like Tommy Nunez's call. Hit to the cow. Michael, I didn't see your hands on him, Michael. But I believe you. But I believe you. I saw one. I saw on this other one hand on him. I believe you, man. So is that how Messi and his squad okay. gets treated? Really? Right? I believe you, Michael. Tell, whatever you say, I didn't I'm in. see two hands, but I believe you. You didn't see the video, but he slinks <laughs> up behind him, too, like a little puppy dog. Like, hey, I believe you. I didn't see the hand, but I believe you if you got fouled, Michael. <laughs> it's good to be have power like that in sports, man. All right, we'll continue with more of your favorite broadcasters, 615-737-1045, coming up. There was also yesterday in conference tournament basketball, there's a lot of good that happens. But in the West Coast Conference, there was some really bad that happened yesterday. We'll talk about it next. Hey, what's going on? It's Will Bowling. Do you have a ceiling light fixture that flickers? Do you need an extra outlet or two? Or do you have wall switches that just don't seem to work the way they're supposed to? Well, these all seem to be simple issues. However, they are rarely do-it-yourself projects. Dealing with electricity requires the expertise of an experienced professional. you got to call the pros over at Lee Company. Their electrical team can solve any problem you have safely and efficiently. And right now, you can enjoy $20 off an electrical service call For a limited time. Just remember this phone number, 615-567-1000. Contact Lee Company there today, 615-567-1000. Or go to LeeCompany.com for an appointment. They'll help solve any problem you have safely, efficiently. Don't do it yourself. Trust the pros at Lee Company. Their website is great, LeeCompany.com. You can schedule an appointment there or call them, 615-567-1000. That's Lee Company, all you need.
Friday morning, and we're acting like it on our own. Kayla and Will RKW is brewed by Eighth and Roast. Coming up in 15 minutes, there is an ESPN writer who made a claim about the National Player of the Year discussion in college basketball that is completely ridiculous. We'll do that coming up at 7 o'clock. 615-737-1045. Who's your favorite color analyst or play-by-play broadcaster in sports right now? Derek in Smyrna is next up on that. What's up, Derek? Yeah, hey, guys. I would say uh, my number one clearly is Mike Keith. And then uh, number two for me would have to be uh, Dick Vitale and honorable mention Joe Rogan of the UFC. Um, those are my three. Solid. Joe brings it on the UFC. Thank you, Derek. He does. I, I give him that one. Oh. Eric in Nashville next up. What's up, Eric? Hey, good morning. How are y'all doing today? Good, good morning. Before I see my favorite announcer, I got something to say to Ramon Foster. Ramon Go Vols, Go SEC Vols. champions. How does that sound, man? That sounds Woo. good, baby. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, thank you guys. But anyway, uh, you made my day, Ramon, doing that. I appreciate it. But anyway, y'all are crazy. I love listening to y'all. But anyway, here's my, my favorite announcers, guys. I have a lot of favorites, but I grew up listening to Pat Summerall and John Madden. I mean, I, I loved it when, when, when football was in season. Every Sunday afternoon, I couldn't wait to listen to Pat Summerall and John Madden. If they were announcing the game, you knew the game meant something in the standings. And John Madden made it so fun to listen to with his uh, telestrator and his boom, bang, and laugh and all that. And Summerall had a great knowledge of uh, play-by-play everybody I know. I like Al Michaels, too, but... At my risk, Pat Summerall and John Madden could not be beat. So, but anyway, go balls and go have balls, a great day, guys. Baby. Nice. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. It's a good call. Yeah, I've definitely seen stuff of Madden back in the day, and he he is he is one of the greatest yep. of all time for sure. Boom! Yeah. He, oh my God, the Turducken, legendary. I think Al's kind of uh, thrown in the towel a little bit at this stage of his life, but he's still. Overall body of work has right. been good, but sometimes on that Thursday night football broadcast, I'm like, Kirk, I feel bad for you, son. <laughs> they just kept feeding him turd sandwiches and making him smile through it. Eventually, he was like, Yeah, I don't care. I just want a steak with no greens near it. Please. Yeah, you know what? They're not feeding him vegetables. Yeah, there you go. Veggies. You Remember, we brought that up. That was it. What was it like? He won't even try broccoli. Like nothing. That's crazy. He will not eat a vegetable. Will not do it. Oof. Braden and Shelbyville up next. What's up, Braden? Good morning, guys. How y'all doing? Great. Good. Good morning. So I got to start off with my least favorite, and I cannot stand Danielson. Light my ears on fire, mm. please, Lord. <laughs> you can't go a week without mentioning Tim Tebow. But anyway, <laughs> I mean, it's Tim Tebow everything on a one-yard quarterback draw. Like, no, that is not Tebow. But um, Burt Burlecamp screaming money, that's a childhood memory. And I think this guy's retired now, but I'll never get tired of hearing his calls as Mike Breen. Bang. Bang. I got, that's one of my favorite slogans. And uh, I hope you have a good Friday and good rest of your weekend. Thanks. Thank you, Braden. Thanks. Brother. It's a good call. Yeah. I think there are a lot of <laughs> SEC fans glad to have a, maybe a change. Gary yeah. Daniels. This uh, fall. Burt Burlecamp. We talked about him the other day. And I, yeah. my fandom grew even more. It did. He'll be on the show next week, officially. There we go. You think we could get him to record some live ad libs for me to add to the board? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What what do you mean? Like, hey, Bert, could you just say, money, talk to me, Will. Like, and just get in other radio fashions, like in music radio, when you have big guests on like that, after you're done (laughs) with the interview, you're like, hey, would you mind saying like uh, a couple lines for me? Like, oh, you're listening to blah, 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 country radio. I wonder if we can get Bert to do some ad libs for us. Might as well ask. Can you please ask him when he does it? I'll see what I can do. He seemed like a very nice. Nice guy. He is super cool. Yeah. Just give a, a couple of your big lines. Yeah, just you know? a couple of just them. Just play the hits really quick, Bert. Exactly. You play the hits real quick. From one Bert to another Bert. Let's go to <laughs> Kyle in Nashville up next. What's up, Kyle? Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, I want to start out. So, favorite would be Mike Tirico. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he just does a great job. Mm-hmm. Good pick. Um, honestly, he's got a soft voice. Makes you want to just, you know, Cuddle up and watch the game and have a good time. Uh, <laughs> and now as far as least favorite would be Chris Collinsworth. Ugh, I yeah. think 
the, one of the most annoying things that, about him is he he picks one guy and he runs with it and he just makes it seem like they're the greatest thing since sliced bread and it just really like Patrick Mahomes for example it just really grinds my gears. I appreciate you for uh, taking my call. Thanks. Yeah, Thank you, Kyle. I'm with you. Now here's a guy with a really good phone call to Ramon Kalen Will. <laughs> You guys know he he like owns part of PFF or whatever. Yeah. When you're looking at their draft rankings, if there is a ranking that has not been filled out, it has a it yep. is a blank default ranking that says, "So here's a guy." Literally. Oh, if you go to PFF's page and look at any prospect and go to draft profile early in the process before they've done intricate breakdowns of that player yeah. it will literally just be a blank page that says now here's a guy oh That's i noticed crazy. that like a month ago too and <laughs> chuckled to myself probably at like 9 p.m putting all of our rundown together i i also would say i i don't care for his son so i would not mind if i never yeah. saw his son again poor jack no jack <laughs> sorry jack. like or j-a-c jack oh, is, is it really spe- spelled j-a-c yeah there's no oh. k it's, uh, just of course J-A-C. it's just j-a-c it's just j-a-c had to be original just a collinsworth yeah just the collinsworth there we go that joke, A-A-C-K, you know what? as bad as Pacific's first half of the West Coast <laughs> Conference Tournament yesterday. Did you guys see this? Mm-mm. At halftime in the first round of the West Coast Conference, which, by the way, has one of the wildest tournament formats of any tournament in any sport <laughs> that I have ever seen. The halftime score of Pepperdine and Pacific, 58 to 9. Bravo. Yeah. 58 to 9. In the first half, Pacific went 3 of 28 from the field. <laughs> shooting an astounding 11%. What do you tell your team <laughs> if they go three of 28 from the field at halftime? Terrible. What does that halftime speech sound like? Well, the coach is already fired, too, so you might as well get rid of everybody else. <laughs> I saw that they had, quote, reassigned the assistant coach to be the head coach. It's, it's That's crazy. Bad. Like, I went back and looked at their history, too, or this this past year. This isn't one of their worst wins, too. I mean, this isn't the only worst win they've had. They had a 48-point loss. Okay, to St. Mary's. They had a 59-point loss last night. I know, but, like, th- yeah. this is two times in a year they've only scored tw- less than 30 points. <laughs> Can you imagine being a part of a squad that l- less than 30? Thir- it- it- it's a college, y'all. Yeah, and this is the WCC. Like, Gonzaga and St. Mary's are legit, but oh. other than that, well, like, this isn't, usually. like, world-beating conference. Yeah, 28 points in a game. That's bad. 615-737-1045. An ESPN writer explained why Zach Eady is his National Player of the Year, and the reasoning is completely ridiculous. Next. It's Ramon Foster for Genesis Diamonds, man. Here are some facts about engagement rings you need to know because the summertime's coming up, wedding season and all that, okay? But there are 10 premier bridal designers every woman knows about. They're like the Mercedes with a Louis Vuitton of engagement rings. World-class, iconic, quality names. Names like Sikori and Viraggio. These designers are hard to get. Every jewelry store wants them, but very few make the cut. So they have to settle for lesser brands or knockoffs. Around here, there's only one jewelry store that offers these premium premium rings and it's genesis diamonds genesis is the only one that made the cut that meets the highest standards genesis is the only store that is allowed to offer these exceptional brands that women really want other stores are jealous of this also and will try to convince you that they're more expensive and try to get you to settle for something else but the truth is genesis has top top quality designer rings for under two thousand dollars it's not about the price it's about the craftsmanship and quality and detail and individuality okay so don't compromise do not settle Get her a world-class ring so she will be proud to wear it. Genesis Diamonds. They're located in Green Hills and Cool Springs and also home to the state's largest selection of luxury pre-owned Rolexes.
What's going on? 701. Good morning from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. A lot of contracts getting done yesterday in the NFL. Some players that were tagged signing long-term extensions. Others just getting their feet wet in the market. But that's all right. As Patriots signing Steelers offensive tackle Chooks Okorafor, the Rams re-signing guard Kevin Dotson, one of the better guards on the market, for three years, $48 million. The Dolphins signing former Titans tight end Jonu Smith on a two-year, $10 million deal. And the first uh, franchise taggy signing a long-term extension, Jalen Johnson, headed back to Chicago on a four-year, $76 million deal, averaging 19 a year. That's the ninth highest cornerback contract on average in the NFL. And Nashville SC and Miami ends in a 2-2 tie last night. The teams will meet on Wednesday night in Miami for the second leg of the home-and-home portion of the round of 16, with Miami holding a decisive edge thanks to the away goals rule. Before the match, though, Nashville announced a contract extension with midfielder Hani Mukhtar to keep the 22 MLS MVP and Golden Boot winner with the club through 2026. Nashville also has an option for 2027 for the two-time All-Star, who is also the club's all-time leader in goals, assists, and points. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Seven AM in Nashville as we welcome you into our number two on a Friday morning edition of RKW. Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed by Eighth the Roast. Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Will Bowling, Robert Walsh making the show happen. 615-737-1045. How you jump in? Stream it live on 1045 the Zone TV, Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter, or Twitch. Twitch, Twitch. Oh, Ty. And coming up in 15 minutes, Brent Hubs of VolQuest joins us for his weekly visit here on the show. Guys, the National Player of the Year discussion in college basketball has made me dumber. Uh, ESPN.com writer Jeff Borzello writes this yesterday. When giving out awards, first of all, it doesn't have Lamont Paris as the National Coach of the Year, which I think is ridiculous. But that's not even the worst part of this piece. He says, Player of the Year, Zach Eady, Purdue. Okay, that's fine. Most people have Zach Eady as their player of the year, whatever. The reasoning. He writes, the player of the year race was over before Thanksgiving. Eady torched a loaded Maui invitational field to the tune of 25.3 points and 13 rebounds in three games, essentially locking up the award. In what world are we handing out awards for players with 5% of the season finished? That is like saying to a tongue of Iloa, great first two weeks. You're the NFL MVP. You know what? The NFL MVP award is wrapped up by the end of September. Great job. Kyler Murray, Arizona Cardinals in 2021. You are the MVP. In what world should Zach Eady be given national player of the year before Thanksgiving? Yeah, I, I'll say this. I'll give Zach Eady credit for what he's done. Okay. And he's been a great player. The, the last two seasons, we've seen what he's done. It's hard not to miss what he's done. Um, he averages 24 points per game. It's second best in the entire college basketball world. Uh, rebounds, he's right there at three with 11.7, averaging that per game. Like The guy is clearly the best on his team and helps his, t- his team be better. They've gotten some great wins this season um, You know, outside of the Big Ten, too, against some top caliber programs. But you cannot make a decision, especially in college basketball with so many games. They play so many games. And really, a season can go either way, too. And so to make up your mind at the Maui Invitational halfway through at Thanksgiving time that this is the player of the year and there is nobody else that matters, that's that's what's a laugh. Yeah. Like there, there, there is so much that other players have done, including Dalton Connect, with a really loaded SEC schedule 
and loaded back end SEC schedule where we've watched him play incredible basketball, where you can argue Edie is maybe not playing right now against the cr- the greatest teams in the Big Ten. Yeah. To me, it's, uh, as as you just said a second ago, it's laughable. It's almost uh, lazy. It's, um, it takes away from the credit that people gives people, that gives these guys that work at these big big networks. It almost seems like as if your narrative is seen up close and personal with this type of stuff to me. Um, when you make a lazy take like that, when you just say you're Zach Eady and don't really look at what the resume is, or you become a regional judger. Like, that's the thing about it, too, is right. you, you're you more familiar with a guy like Zach Eady when it comes down to having that conversation. So it's easy for you to say that type of stuff. I hate when they do this as far as these types of people, like I said, the big big networks that control the narratives. Here he is with a front page article about the disappointments and the greatness that this season has been. And he dropped the most named person as Zach Eady. For me, it comes down to just looking at the overall body of work, too. Like, legitimately saying to yourself, this team got better. This team won a division. I don't think those early Thanksgiving tournaments, Christmas tournaments, are real litmus tests to what your team is capable of. I think you learn and grow in that. I think it sets up your resume as far as overall judging of your team and what style of ball you can adjust to. I think Dalton Connect adjusted this year. Yeah. From where we saw him early in the season trying to plow through guys, and then he turns into a facilitator, and then a scorer, and then the team gets better. And there's times where he wasn't as effective in games, but he also made his teammates better. You see people doing the exact same stuff to him as they do to Zach Eady. Like, when you watch those games where they're bear-hugging, okay, Dalton Connect, and it's understandably he's, what, five inches shorter than what Zach Eady has going on, too. You speak about the pro- projection as far as him being a uh, an NBA player. And I don't know what Zach Eady's future is going to be as far as playing in the league, but the effectiveness of what Dalton Connect is capable of doing, and you even got to throw in Sears, too, from Alabama. Like, you can't mention one without the other. I think those three have a solid race for player of the year nationally. But to make a lazy take to say that a guy won it this early in the season is so premature, it's silly, it's dumb, and I think you lose trust yeah. when you make those type of statements. You know, like, it, it's – you got to be careful with your words to me when you're in this sports media. Yeah. Because people come to you and they pay for this stuff now. ESPN is a paid app when it comes down to streaming. And when you have folks that that believe in your workers and they make lazy takes like this, it ruins it for me. Honestly, it does. That type of stuff ticks me off because it shouldn't be that. I got into this and I say this often as somebody that's, that wants to be taken serious as a former athlete. And you have people that have done this all their life, and they don't take it serious because now it's just clickbait. I hate that type of stuff. And and to me, the bigger issue is if this was college football and ESPN had a special show for two hours where they needed to create intrigue about who was going to win a national player of the year, a la the Heisman Trophy, you would never see something written like this, ever. You know why? Two words. Charles Woodson. That simple. ESPN, I'm old enough to remember. I was barely alive. I'm old enough to remember (laughs) when ESPN created a Charles Woodson Heisman candidacy so people would pay attention and watch the Heisman. And then he beat Peyton Manning for it, which never should have (laughs) happened. If National Player of the Year for Basketball was a feature show that was aired on ESPN or ABC on a Saturday night at the end of the season, you would never see an ESPN writer say, yeah, the award was wrapped up by Thanksgiving. It's like saying, yeah, oh, yeah, Peyton Manning, you know, had the Heisman by week three. Done. It, truthfully, and, and in a different sport as far as the NFL goes, to me, and y'all push back on me. Y'all let me know where I'm coming from with this. But the defensive player of the year was justified, I feel like, through PFF. The win rates that they had uh, as far as rushing. Miles Garrett. The Miles Garrett yeah. situation. Yeah. If, if we've had a template in place for a very long time that says you do this, you do this, and you do that, and you outbest somebody else in all these other categories, you should win it. To me, again, I'm I'm cordial with PFF. Sam and I had a really – Sam Monson and I had a good conversation at the draft, and we were just standing by the doors talking, I mean, at the at the combine. But when it's justified and the stats don't match or the play and effectiveness doesn't match, and maybe that's where Miles Garrett won it this year. Um, it's, it's, it's super interesting. And I know it's, it, it will probably be viewed as, okay, well, you guys want Dalton Connect to win it. It should go to the best player. 
It should go to the player that absolutely made his team better. Uh, and, and I don't want to. I, I don't. I don't want to minimize Zach Eady yeah, because no, he is a made threat. Their teams better. He is a threat. But there's two styles of balls I think that we're looking at. Do you get a big man award when you have one of these type of guys like Sheway was in the conversation like a couple years ago, right? Do you have a big man player of the year? Or do you have a point guard player of the year? That's what we're getting at because I think when you view bigs versus the point guards, there is a different style of game and impact that you can have on it too. Yeah. And if it's just simply about size and domination, which I love the fact that size is a part of this equation for Zach Eady. I never shy away from bigs, right? But the styles are different when you come to judging point guards versus bigs. And the, when it comes down to it, though, ESPN likes headlines. They like to make sure that they, uh, you know, kind of put the headline out there. Like, so a name like Zach Eady, that's going to catch attention, right? He won it last year. He's always talked about in terms of college basketball this year, not talking about the Dal- Dalton Connect is not. But I feel like sometimes ESPN likes to sensationalize certain things. And this is one of those things, especially if you're saying at the midway point that this guy is already the player of the year. I'm sorry. That's sensationalizing a guy and his name has a lot to do with it. And that's the biggest issue. To me, the better way to sensationalize it, though, even would be, hey, here's this guy who drops like 40 a game mm-hmm. in big games on our network. He should be getting more credit. Is, does he have more of a case? Like that, to me, it's not even good headline grabbing. Yeah. Well, they think it is. 615-737-1045. Brent Hubs of VolQuest next on RKW. It's Ramon Foster for Wesley Mortgage. I'm here to tell you guys this, okay? Wesley Mortgage right now is currently recruiting top mortgage talent. They are hiring. If you did not know, uh, Wesley Mortgage is also the official mortgage provider of the Tennessee Titans and the big machine Music City Grand Prix. I'm here to tell you about their owner, too, real quick, man. If you ran into Chuck Medall, you know this. He's a local Nashville native, man. He cares about his community. I'm proud to serve them. Chuck reinvests in the people and the places that make Nashville such a wonderful place. I'm telling you right now, you should join should join Chuck McDowell's team. Uh, right now, other mortgage companies are downsizing. Chuck McDowell and the Wesley Mortgage Team are rapidly expanding in Nashville and keeping people working in a career that they love. They would love to have you join their team. If you want to be a part of Nashville, watch it grow and also help yourself grow. Simply visit whywesley.com and get on board with the team at Wesley Mortgage. Dickens Turf and Landscape Supply, that is the place to go to take care of your lawn in any season here in Middle Tennessee. We're joined by our friend Trey Hartsook. And Trey, you guys are all over Middle Tennessee, but you've also got one change to some of those locations, right? Absolutely, Will. So something that's really cool that we're going to do, we're really focusing on, hey, how can we be more efficient? And we look back and we say, hey, maybe just two stores in Williamson County would be great. We're still going to be off 65 on Frierson Street at the old Brentwood Lawnmower Building. And then we're still going to be down in Franklin on Downs Boulevard. So we still service the Williamson County area. We're just not going to be at the Cool Springs location behind the mall. We were there a long time. Actually, that was our second store that we ever had. Um, just, But we really want to be efficient. We want to serve the community. We felt like it was best serve with just having our two locations so if you need anything at either one of those locations we can do it and our Bellevue store you know for people that were kind of splitting that drive either either one of those locations or any of our other ones we're still in Nashville Hendersonville Murfreesboro Bellevue Brentwood like we just talked about Franklin like we just talked about and Mount Julia so stop and see us thank you so much
Our KW, Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed by 8th and Rose Stomp 1045 The Zone. Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Will Bowling, and on Friday mornings when you hear the country music, it means it's time to talk some balls. Ball quested on threes. Brent Hubbs joins us for his weekly visit right now. What's up, Brent? Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good. Uh, we are great. I'm excited to see the neon moon of a Bucky sign tomorrow on my way to Knoxville. So neon moon, the uh, the perfect song this morning. <laughs> I had um, I had dinner. I didn't have dinner with him, but he sat across from me at a uh, Italian restaurant in Nashville. Kix Brooks did back when he was just getting his uh, oh, wow. winery stuff started. Nice. So that was my that was my one interaction with Kix Brooks there from the neon moon. So, you know, love that. Fascinating. Bert played that right oh, yeah. there. And I was just like, this is a banger. I'm not sure if I should call that song a banger, but I was vibing to that right there. Uh, that's you. Put your cowboy boots on. Get a little line dancing going for you there. I might, be you, ready to roll. you might see me doing it this weekend, okay, in person. So just, just, just if you do, do not pull out your camera phone. <laughs> Please do, Brent. Uh, Brent, I, I loved what you guys did on VolQuest on the anatomy of Tennessee's SEC championship winning basketball team. As you look through this entire season and this journey Tennessee has had to get to the point where they can cut down the nets tomorrow in Knoxville, what do you like the most about this team right now? What do I like about the most is the, the versatility that's emerged out of this team. Um, obviously, you go back to April when Dalton Connect committed and – um, nobody knew what Tennessee was exactly getting there, including Tennessee. But obviously, he's changed the trajectory of what they do offensively. Then when Zakai Ziegler returned to form, played 38 minutes um, in Houston against NC State, pronounced he was back. But then you really look over the last couple of months and you see the emergence of being able to play uh, Adu and Awaka at the same time. And then they can go really small and play with – Josiah Jordan James at the center spot, at the five spot, if they wanted to. This is as versatile of a basketball team as Rick Barnes has had in a long, long time. I asked him on ball calls when the last time he had a team this versatile, he could play that many different lineups and that many different styles. And, and he wouldn't give me a year. He just said it's been a long, long time, meaning it hadn't happened at Tennessee. And I think it's that versatility is part of the reason why everybody's so excited about this team for postseason play, because they seem to be able to match up against any style of play that they go against. Brent, when was the last time the SEC was this good at hoops, too? I know Rick Barnes thinks uh, it's the best it's been since he's been here. What's your take? I just probably, I mean, I could make a case it's as good as it's been, the best it's been since I've covered it. That's 30 years. Um, there, there's a couple things that have happened. One, that this league made a real commitment under Mike Sly to improve its basketball. So what they did was financially they made some commitments to hire some really good coaches, some proven coaches not just some young up-and-comers. Now, they've got some young coaches who are kind of getting their first starts and are doing a great job. Coach Golden at, at Florida has done a heck of a job this year. But they got a bunch of veteran coaches in this league, too, which I think has helped it. They've gone out and played a bunch of people as well. They no longer stack 12, 15 meaningless non-conference wins. They're playing everybody around the country, and I think that's helped this league become more competitive night in and night out. And I think you can make the case it's as good as you've seen in, in two decades plus. Brent Hubbs with us this morning, VolQuest on three. Also, your mu music aficionado, okay, and all no. things sports, <laughs> pop culture. Uh, with, the, with that being said, as far as basketball is concerned, you saw this team go into uh, South Carolina and come out with a dub. What, what was the feel going into that one, knowing what was actually on the table for them to accomplish? Well, I mean, I thought Tennessee was going to win the, the, the all week long or a couple of days after the, the Alabama game. And the reason I felt that way was, one, they got punked at home by South Carolina. They got beat pretty good. They got physically beat up pretty good. And I knew that wasn't going to sit well with a guy like Zakai Ziegler, who was over against South Carolina in Knoxville. Uh, and, and Tennessee just didn't play very well. They, they let a lot of standing around watching and uh, just weren't very good on either end of the floor. Um, and, and I just felt like that they knew going in it would be a toughness game, so they knew exactly what to expect and that they would match South Carolina's toughness, uh, and they did. Um, and, and what this team's been able to do during this three-game run here that they close out the fourth game with Kentucky, which is against quad one opponents, ranked opponents, which is the toughest close in college basketball, they've been able to finish games in the last five minutes. And I think that's the ultimate part, too, that – has everybody excited about 
this team in the postseason and while the national pundits are talking about Tennessee a little differently now than they were two weeks ago. It's because when the game gets down to the last five minutes, Tennessee's been the tougher team mentally and physically, and they've made the needed plays to go win games. And, and that's the you know that's the best thing they've done the last week and a half. We'll see if they get it done one more time on Saturday. Brent Hubs, in, in your War Room uh, breakdown for us, man, of all quests on three, you have the uh, spring practices kicking up. And as it stands right now, they're putting speakers in helmets. And you said Hypo's not as high on it. You didn't say he wasn't as high on it. It's just kind of blah about it. Why is that the case for uh, something that the NFL also does as far as communicating through the helmet? I, I think that Josh Hypo is going to experiment with it this spring because he wants to figure out he wants to make sure it doesn't slow them down. They want to stay fast. And one of the advantages that they have in staying fast is all 11 guys can turn to the sideline or the center and then everybody else, um, skill guys, turn to the sideline and get a call and go. Quarterback can turn and get a call. He can get the call while the play is finishing up. Uh, and it allows them to go fast. Now, you got to have the three guys over there dressed like they're part of the Wiggles a cartoon with the little black screens behind them giving the signals. But but to do that, they can go fast. I think the one concern you have with the with the microphone is, hey, when are they going to turn it back on that you can communicate with the quarterback? And, and do you slow down the communication process by sending something to the quarterback verbally, and then he has to convey it to the receivers, the backs, and the center, to get things set up front, or is it faster for everybody to get a call at the same time? I think that's why Josh Heupel is a little bit skeptical of what it looks like. I think they'll create some kind of hybrid, meaning they'll have it in the quarterback's headset to where the coach can talk to him, um, you know, pre-stamp if they need to, and they're playing slow, but they're also going to signal it in from the sideline so that they could play fast. I think the defensive guys are going to, in college football are going to like it better than the offensive guys are going to like it because it's going to allow for late adjustments for the defense where they don't have to turn their head to the sideline and get a call or get somebody's attention um, that they can get it. You know, somebody can get it verbally in their helmet and then they can convey it to their teammates around them, particularly if you're adjusting on the back end, right? Maybe you don't fix the front end. You, you don't change your front in terms of, what your pass rush is, but maybe you want to change your coverage. You want to roll something based on a formation you see. You can communicate that easier verbally than you can with signals late. Two things in on that. One, don't ever play in New England because your microphones will go out, okay? And two, <laughs> the other one is um, they'll probably have to get to one-word plays. That's something we did when we were up-tempo, no huddle. Let's go one-word play. So it's going to be interesting to see how they communicate that Communicate that to the uh, offensive line. Like, one word for us would be like Cadillac, and that was 76 protection. So Yeah. And again, I mean, that's why that's why Josh Heupel didn't use it during bowl practice or the bowl game when you could experiment with it. He wanted 15 well, – he's going to use spring practice with 15 practices, but he wanted time – to tinker with it. Okay, does this work? Because you can run it one way during practice and go, yeah, we ain't doing that. You know, but you feel differently if you're preparing for a game. In spring practice, you're preparing for nothing. So do you change your language, right? Do you change what you're talking about? Or do you say, hey, we're going to do – one day we're going to do it the old way, and the next day we're going to do it with the with the speaker. And let's, stop, let's put it on the stopwatch. How fast are we going? Which is better for us? All those types of things are stuff that they're going to look at um, this spring. And here's the other thing, too. Josh Heupel admitted uh, in an interview yesterday uh, with On Three's J.D. Piquel, as a player, he didn't like it. He didn't like somebody talking in his head while he was trying to survey the defense. He kind of wanted to be left alone as a player. Now, as he admitted, he got a cup of coffee in the NFL, so uh, it wasn't like they did it a long time to him. But he was never real, never got real comfortable with it uh, when, when he tried it out in exhibition games and that kind of stuff. Brent Hubs of VolQuest joined us this morning on RK Dub, like he does every Friday at this time. Let's go back to the hardwood, Brent. And obviously, a game with Kentucky this weekend to end the regular season. Yes, they wrapped up the regular season SEC title. But why is this still a big game? You've got the rivalry, but you've also got some prospects in town? Yeah, I mean, this is a big game because they're going to have a handful of prospects. They, they have marked this day. 
uh, because it's a, it's a good time to bring in prospects when you look at it. Uh, it's a mid-afternoon game, so guys can get up on Saturday morning and, and drive in. Uh, like Chance Mallory is a twenty-five, a class of twenty-five point guard from Charlottesville, Virginia. He he doesn't have to leave Friday early from school to get here for an early game, or he's not going to be stuck overnight if he doesn't want to be in, in Knoxville because the game's over at midnight. He can come and go. So the 4 o'clock start, when they announced that, that it was going to be that way on, on CBS, that was a perfect time to get guys in who were driving in. Huntsville, Alabama, Hillsboro, North Carolina. You look at the guys who are coming in um, in the class of 25 and 26, those guys are regional guys that, that are – able to drive in and drive out very easily for unofficial visits. So it's a big one that way. It's also the final game for um, Dalton Connect, although he's not been here a long time. It's certainly a fan favorite. And then Josiah Jordan-James and Santiago Vescovi for, for their senior day. Big day for them. Nobody wants to leave their home floor in their final game with a loss. So Tennessee will be ready to go. Um, Kentucky can be really good, or Kentucky can be not so good. They're the most Jekyll and Hyde team out there. They get hot. Hey, I'm telling you, they get hot, they can be in the Final Four. They have one of those days they can go home the first round. That's just who Kentucky is right now. Um, but they're a better basketball team now than they were when Tennessee beat them in Rupp Arena a month or so ago. So it should be a heck of a matchup. Well, Tennessee hoping it can be a Final Four team, obviously, with Dalton Connect being such a difference maker on this team. We had this conversation earlier today on our show about Zach Eady and Dalton Connect. What gives you, you know, the notion that maybe it is a Dalton Connect that maybe is more deserving than a Zach Eady? Or, or would you say give Zach Eady that? Well, my, my problem with Zach Eady winning it is everybody will everybody decided in October Zach Eady was going to win it. It didn't matter what anybody else did. Uh, that you know they could have might as well submitted votes back at midnight madness or whatever we don't have anymore back when practice started because once he came back for another year he was he was going to win it and, and that's my frustration is I, when people make the argument about Zach Eady they they don't they don't talk about really what he's accomplished or what he's doing now they just it's Zach Eady he won it last year and just because you won it last year doesn't and you came back doesn't mean you should win it a second year. Even if your numbers are good this year, and I think his numbers are good or is, are better than they were a year ago, uh, I just think when you look at Dalton Connect, the story he is, the transition he's made to this level of basketball, um, the league that they played in, how difficult it's been every night, how he's put this team on his back at different points in time, he certainly should be further in the conversation. It should it should be a debate right now. It's not because everybody decided before Dalton Connect really ever made a jump shot for Tennessee. There were people voting for Zach Eady before Dalton Connect played against Michigan State in an exhibition game in late October. Brent Hubbs of OnQuest said on three, our guests here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. <laughs> Brent, I love this quote from Tennessee assistant coach Rod Clark in his recruitment of Dalton Connect saying, I told him, we struggled on offense and we need offense. You're one of the worst defenders in college basketball. You need defense. And just that recruitment from Rod Clark in identifying Dalton Connect and bringing him to Knoxville. When Rick Barnes' assistants can identify and recruit talent like this in today's era of college basketball, has the, I don't want to say life expectancy, because that's a weird way to put it, but has the, the, the tenure for Rick Barnes maybe now longer in today's day and age with the changes in college basketball than it maybe would have been five, six years ago as he remains at Tennessee? That's a great question. And, and I think it's not just his staff's ability to identify guys, because if you... If you follow, you know, the recruitment of Tennessee players and even Texas players for Rick Barnes, those those assistants go out and put in all the legwork, and and then they came they come back with, okay, we're gonna go, you're gonna go to this gym and, and watch this tournament. Here's the three or four guys we want you to watch. Don't go watch, you know, 17 games. We want you to watch three games that involve these five players because we've. Because what those assistants do is they know what Rick Barnes is looking for, and they narrow the pool for him, okay? So it, they weed out some stuff for, for Rick Barnes in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, but what's changed is it's the transfer portal, and, and, it, and it's twofold. One, um, you don't have to recruit guys as long, okay? So you're not recruiting a guy from the time he was in the eighth grade for him to tell you he's not coming heading you know, into his senior year that you lost out to somebody and, and you had four years invested in him and that's the guy you centered everything around. Now, you still recruit high school players, but it's different in, in that regard because if you lose out on a guy, 
there's a way, there's an avenue to go replace that guy. And you can replace him in the portal by recruiting a guy for a week, two weeks in a lot of cases. And that's basically what they did with Dalton Connect. And you're getting a mature basketball player. Now, imagine telling a high school player, hey, we need you because you can score, but you need us because you're terrible on defense. Now, imagine what the reaction is from that kid, his AAU coach, his uncle, his dad, everybody who's involved in his recruitment. Well, you don't want to play for this guy. He says you're terrible. And, and all of a sudden now you're having to recruit that guy differently, right? You're having to, you're having to be much more flowery and you're great and you're the next this, you're the next that. Transfer kids are, are transferring for a reason. They're looking for something. Rod Clark identified what Dalton Connect was looking for. He wanted to be coached hard. He knew he needed to improve on defense. He knew he liked to be challenged, understood his personality. And Dalton Connect could handle being told, you're not very good. You need us. And, and so it's a different style of recruitment because, one, it's shorter, and, B, you're dealing just with the kid. You don't have as many surrounding parts around them with transfer kids, particularly in basketball, as you would have when they were – you know, playing in a seventh grade tournament or an eighth grade tournament, and you're out there recruiting that kid. Hey, Brent, and how, I guess, specific is it for these these coaches when they're trying to get these transfers that it not only, you know, is going to benefit them in the way on the the hardwood, but also, like, it's got to be a fit. Because if these guys aren't a fit, like, it's not going to work as a whole. I think that's a big part of it, too, right? And there's no doubt. And, and Rick Barnes talks about this all the time. You're not recruiting, you're evaluating. And what you're evaluating is, is the guy talented enough to help you? And, and does the guy fit what you're doing culturally? Basketball is unique in that in football visits, you know, there's you, you hear about barbecues and you hear about these shows that they put on for guys when they come in for visits a lot of times, you know, photo shoots, which you can't do now, but everything that you've done in the past. Basketball, it's not a workout, but they find their way to the gym with a basketball, and they play pickup, okay? So in basketball, the, the players on your team, on your, your current players, have a very good feel for who that person is on and off the court. When they play with them, so they can tell you if he can play or not. Two, how does he, how does he interact on the court? How does he play with people? How does he – is he a ball hog? Does he listen to what people – veterans say to him? All of those types of things – you get a much better gauge of the personality because you're dealing with smaller numbers and you interact with them in the setting that you're going to interact with them all the time anyway, which is basketball. Football, it's different, right? You can't put pads on and go play, so you don't get that same type of uh, approach. You don't learn their mentality that way. I mean, Jemai Meshack's talked about this with Dalton Connect. I mean, he went to Rick Barnes and said, we got to have this guy. A, he can score because I'm having a hard time stopping him. And B, the guy's a football or a basketball junkie, man. I mean, he loves the game. He fits what we're all about. We need to get him. We need to do whatever we can to get that guy. You get that vibe. You get that kind of reaction in basketball. It's harder to do in football, so it's a little bit different that way. Yeah. He is Brent Hubbs of Onquest and On3, bringing it every Friday morning here with us on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. Brent, great stuff. Thank Definitely. you. Definitely. Thanks, Brent. I Appreciate it. Y'all have a great rest of the weekend, okay? It's yes, sir. Too. There's Brent Hubs of All Quest triggering me talking about barbecues and recruiting. I know. For Tennessee basketball. <laughs> but that's okay. Definitely take you back to Bruce's era. Is that what you're saying? Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that stupid now we think of that? And that was like a thing. Still it hate is. you, Aaron Craft. Golly. Crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up next, we had a guest on the show earlier this week who did something spectacular last night. I'll tell you who it is and what they did next. Hey, it's Will Bowling. Do you or someone close to you find it maddening to hear conversation when there's background noise? Maybe it's while you're eating at your favorite restaurant, you're in a crowded room. There's a lot of different conversations going on around you. Maybe you're just in a crowded arena watching your favorite team play on the hardwood this month. Well, if so, I want to introduce you to my friends at Brentwood Hearing Center. With five doctors of audiology, state-of-the-art diagnostic equipment, and the most recent hearing device technology, they want to help you get off the sidelines and back in the game of better hearing. 
And with over 85 years of experience from their convenient location, just off of I-65 in Brentwood, they tailor a hearing solution to each individual patient. Give them a call today, 615-377-0420. They're going to sit down with you. They're going to learn where you have the most trouble hearing, and they're going to have the latest technology to help make it better. Visit them online at BrentwoodHearingCenter.com, 615-377-0420. Let the mayhem be on the court this March. That's Brentwood Hearing Center online at BrentwoodHearingCenter.com. Brentwood Hearing Center, better hearing, better life.
Look, scientists say, and nine out of ten doctors agree, that if you come on this show, you're going to do something cool. Truth. It's RKW, Ramon, Kayla, and Will, brewed by 8th and Rose, 615-737-1045. The Nashville Predators get back in the win column, defeating the Sabres, have a 10-game point streak, and Philip Forsberg, just about 48 hours and some change after coming on this radio program, scores a hat trick. We're hey, taking wow. credit for it. Got to. When it's good. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying? Yeah. We are taking credit. Yeah. Uh, number nine in terms of his career hat tricks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> that always makes me jump out of my seat. I didn't know what it was. I'm like, what the? Um, he has 33 goals on the season now. And nine games away from his career high. He is cooking this cooking year. Cooking right now. That's big time right there, man. Of course, Buck goes to games and they lose. Yeah. You got a forty hour reset with us, and you get a hat trick. Mm-hmm. That's the that's 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 pretty much now that's, our pipeline to the press. Come on our show, you win. Exactly. You win yes. You have career nights. Twenty six days for UC Soros. My neighbor Yakov Trenin got traded yesterday. Wait, that was your neighbor? Mm-hmm. No kidding. Yep. I can say that now that he's gone. I, I feel less bad yeah. about <laughs> giving more Putting info on there. where a professional athlete lives in Nashville because I imagine he won't live there anymore. Mm-hmm. That's, that's I'd see him in my building all the time. See if he's uh, doing any moving sales. I love that. I know. Can you rid any furniture? Yeah. He'd probably just give it away. Hey, he, he might. I it. mean, seriously. I probably still shouldn't say that, but oh well. That's okay. <laughs> People don't know where I live, though. I just know downtown, which that could be so many buildings. Right. That's Hidden right. gems. Back in the day, that up. would be narrowing it down to a couple buildings, but not anymore. I still don't know where you live. So. Good. Yeah. Let's keep Is it that it, way. Yeah, I was going to say. Do not so you invite me over for a barbecue. Let's keep it that way, bud. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Get ready have. to learn hospitality, <laughs> bozo. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Is that a Dwight Schrute moment? No, that's the uh, – <laughs> it's the, the meme of Adam Silver saying, get ready to learn Chinese, buddy. I, I mm-hmm. About games being played in China. Oh, yeah. I and miss so that it's, one. It, that gets memed a lot of, get ready to learn X, Y, or Z here. So it's like, you know – yeah. Teams going to the Big Ten. Get ready to learn New Jersey, buddy. Like, I don't know. Use stuff like Oregon. that <laughs> happens all the time. Yeah, for real. Um, um, I wanted to mention real quick about the Preds, too. So they're playing good hockey, but now they're going to go on the road for four games, I believe. Four. Those long road trips can either make you or break you sometimes. Like, if, if you start a road trip off yeah. poorly, it can trickle. So that's, I think, a big week for them coming up. Because I think you need to at least capture two of those yeah. to be able to, you know, keep, keep in the playoff mix, yeah. right? Okay. I mean, I don't know what – football's so different because you're not on the road for that extended period of time. Week. Yeah, it's only one a week. That's I what's know. super unique about it. That's why you get super emotional about football sure. wins and losses too. So, yeah, that is fascinating um, the, what the road trip can do for It's you. like baseball too. Yeah, baseball does it and basketball also. Mm-hmm. Longest the Titans have had a road trip for a while was when they had Arizona and San Fran back-to-back weeks with Malarkey. and they stayed out West and it was not good. That was a big point of conversation at the time was the, the, the setup of the schedule or yeah. how they, the setup just the, the way schedule. they managed it. Cause they lost mm-hmm. both games. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you, you say that and I'm glad to see it happen here. Not glad to see it happen here, but it happened in Pittsburgh too. Our identity was we couldn't win on the West coast. Really? Like, yeah, it the still thing. sticks to this day. Yep. Yeah, still sticks to this day. Like, when they went out and won in Seattle this year. Yeah. Like, that was a big point. Like, oh, man, I think they won two games on the West Coast this mm-hmm. year. It's the yearly SEC tournament road trip for the Preds. That's right. <laughs> that's right. They have a they CMA trip and a SEC tournament trip. Yeah. Oh, that's why they kicked out of the building. They uh-huh. have a yearly CMA Fest road trip. They're like, out. We got more yeah. entertainment coming in. And same for uh, about that. SEC mm-hmm. tourney. Except when it was in Tampa a couple years ago. Will that be the case when they get the new Nissan Stadium, though? What do you mean? As far as moving the SEC tournament inside of the stadium. Right. I don't think they'll move that you inside. You don't think so? No. I thought Too big. conversation. Too big? Yeah. Oh. No. CMAs? Yes. Maybe. I mean, they, yeah. had, the, they had the All-Star game in uh, Indy. Inside. Different. In, inside. Nope. I'm, I'm, I bet it right now. It's different. I bet it right now. Okay. They'll, they'll put. There's they'll, no way. I bet it right now. Plus, the contract is in Bridgetown through like 2035 also. I'm pretty sure. Dang. Why do you know this? I don't know. You should have trapped or me in a bet. Or it's a Tyrion bet. Lannister. I drink you and lose. I know things. You should have trapped me in a bet right there. I'd I'd, taken that I know. Out. I was trying to push the yeah, bet. I, did. I didn't know either way. Yeah, but. I don't know. Either way, I, I still would bet it. 
2027. In terms of the new agreement, the tournament will be played in Nashville through 2030, with the exception of 2022, with an option to extend the agreement through 2035. I hate you. <laughs> I was so ready to go at them, too. Oh, I was so ready to go at you, Will. You should have uh, took that bet. Now, granted, laughed. this release from Bridgestone Arena uh, says... The SEC has extended its agreement with the Nashville Sports Council that could make Music City the home of the SEC men's basketball tournament through 2035. There is no precedent, though, for other than the Georgia Dome, because they did used to do that every now and then where they'd put the SEC tournament in the Georgia Dome. Uh, There's not a whole lot of precedent for SEC men's basketball tournament being in a football stadium other than that. All right, or just any it. conference basketball tournament. It's just me trying to make my sport the most what popular is, thing in America. That's I, all. Right. The thing it's they have the largest rooftop, though. Well, I don't care about that as much. <laughs> the thing they did with that, though, in the Georgia Dome is they cut off half of it. The way the Carrier Dome cuts off half of that field and makes the capacity smaller but still really big. They wouldn't do it like the NBA All-Star Game did that one year where they put it in, what, Dallas or Arlington? Arlington. Yeah. And they had like a hundred thousand people. Yeah, that's crazy right there. But I mean uh, it could you could be right. You I never I know. Mean, I was Ron thinking Slay of, in the F and Bank chat says it was in New Orleans too. It yeah. was in New Orleans. So they cut off uh the part of the arena as far as the big uh big curtains and stuff like that. Remember possibly. this arena is gonna it, not that it's that small, but it's a, it's gonna be a little smaller. Sorry, stadium is going to be a little smaller than your average NFL yeah, stadium. A little bit more intimate. You could be right. I don't know. I don't back People like down. to party here. I'm just saying they could sell oh, tickets just to go party there. Uh, uh, Slay yeah. says it was in New Orleans and it was dumb in the Superdome, the SEC tournament. You want? I think to it's look better packed. in an arena. I went in 2014 when Tennessee played Florida. Pat Adams gave Jerron Mayman his fourth and fifth fouls at the same time, in uh, with eight minutes left in that game. Yes, I'm bitter. And that game was in the Georgia Dome, and it it felt really weird. Like I'll show you my picture from it in the break. It was kind of strange. Georgia Dome was nasty, too. Ugh. I agree. Considering all the losses I saw in there. I know. Burned it down. I wish nice. I could have pressed the button. <laughs> right? I love the how the hate ball never leaves. Took it, down. it never leaves. Eight o'clock uh, when we come back. We'll talk senior day. Tennessee, Kentucky, Dalton Connect, Josiah Jordan James, and Santiago Vescovi taking the floor tomorrow for the final time in Thompson Bowling Arena. What does Ramon Foster remember most about his senior day? Besides carrying the coach off the field. Talk about that next. All right, I have a question for you. Have you had your eyes checked in the last year, two years, three years? If you have not... You might want to think about doing it, and Wang Vision Institute is the place to get all of your eye health care checked out. Uh, From the receptionist to the doctors, front to back, they do an incredible job of taking care of you and making sure that your vision is good to go now and in the future. They also are always about skincare, and they have now offered the intense pulse size treatments. If you've not familiar with that. It's a photofacial treatment that rejuvenates the skin. Maybe you had some sun damage, dark spots are appearing as you're getting older. These treatments are awesome for evening out that skin texture as well as hyperpigmentation. So for more information on IPL treatments, you can visit wangvisioninstitute.com today. Also, if you want to check out uh, anything about their online vision Um, consultations. They have a seminar every Tuesday. It's at 645 and all you've got to do is RSVP. So you can schedule that and your free consultation and treatment at wangvisioninstitute.com. Your skin and eyes will thank you for the long lasting results.
What's going on? 801 flying by on this Friday from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. A couple players signed yesterday ahead of free agency. Most notably, Patriots signing former Steelers offensive tackle Chooks Okorafor. The Rams re-signing their guard Kevin Dotson, one of the better guards on the market, for a three-year $48 million deal. Dolphins signing former Titans tight end Jonu Smith, two years at $10 million. And the first franchise tag E signing a long-term extension is cornerback Jalen Johnson headed back to Chicago on a four-year $76 million deal averaging 19 a year. That is the ninth highest cornerback contract on average which will look like a bargain when the next cornerback deals get done. And last night, Nashville SC and Enter Miami ends in a 2-2 tie. The teams will meet Wednesday night in Miami for the second leg of the home and home portion of the round of 16 with Miami holding a decisive edge thanks to the away goal rule. But before the match, Nashville announced that a contract extension with Hani Mukhtar was agreed to to keep him in uh, Nashville through 2026. Nashville also has an option for 2027 for the two-time All-Star, who is also the club's all-time leader in goals, assists, and points. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Our KW, Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed by Eight the Roast for two more hours this week. Happy Friday, boys and girls. Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Robert Walsh behind the glass, sending us pictures of birds. That's a thing that's happening this morning. It's One so might cool. say we're bird watching. There we go. <laughs> birds, birds, similar to Foster's kids, but I, I do no good for the community, just the birds. <laughs> anyway, it's Friday, and we'd like for you to act like it, please. <laughs> 1045 The Zone AI with the following announcement. It's Friday and we gonna act like it as you listen to Ramon, Kayla and Will with a song for the workers, a chance to pick up your bottle this afternoon and grab a fresh pair of gaiters. Without further ado, Sir Charles Jones. Workers. Yeah. Yeah. Start your nine to five in about an hour. Don't laugh. You didn't do it. Yeah. (laughs) There it is. (laughs) I think that Bert does that. He picks up on people's like Uh, uh tendencies and stuff, and I hate him for that. My Uh, other favorite thing you say is, oh, me, oh, my, because you sound like a 95-year-old man. I I don't know where I picked that up from. Probably another 95-year-old man. It may have been. Ramon starts a question by saying, I have to ask you this, man. (laughs) One of these days, you're going to start a question with, I don't have to ask you this, man, but I just (laughs) want to know. Right? I I never noticed that. It's all right. It's not a bad thing. Yeah, that's a crutch of mine. No, I I wouldn't say a crutch. No, I I wouldn't say crutch An endearment. It's an endearment. It's a quirk. Yeah, it's, it's a quirk. <laughs> a quirk. It's a, okay, right. now I'm going to just straight up go right into questions. At least you're likable. People hate me. <laughs> I'm not that likable. People hate me, too. <laughs> Trust me. I was told about some Facebook comments and stuff. I was just like, okay. It wasn't anything crazy, of course. Oh. If you ain't got haters, you ain't popping well. You always got to remember that. That's a good point. You know what I tell my kids? They, talk, they never talk about people who suck. They don't. They talk about people who are good. Or you just absolutely hate somebody. But you don't talk about people who suck. Either yeah. you're known enough that you got people that dislike you, or you're real good and they just hate you. That's why we got some polarizing uh, national figures. That's what I'm saying. That's that's why they talk about people who are good or very well known and famous. So. It's not a good business for people to have neutral opinions of you. Mm. Uh, this one isn't. No, because if you hate us, it means you're going to keep listening because you hate. One hundred percent. If you're <laughs> if you're lukewarm, you're like, yeah, I don't really care. Yeah, that's all I'm saying, man. If you hate, you're that's like, right. I want to see what they're saying. Exactly. exactly. That's, that's Putting food on our tables. About. It's good to be talked about, man. 
615-737-1045, how you jump in. Andy Staples of On3 coming up in 15 minutes. He had a sit-down conversation with Lane Kiffin earlier this week. Then had new Washington coach Jed Fish on his show today. He's just out there talking to everybody. That's what I'm saying. And he also made a college football super league on on3.com earlier this week. And I can report to you, this is hard-hitting journalism, that the division Tennessee is in in this is called the Moonshine Division. Whoa. I like that division right there. It's a good article. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, we'll link it to our Twitter page, at Ramon Kayla Will. But we'll dive into that with Andy coming up in just about 15 minutes as there's always lots to discuss in the college football world. You, you want to hear one of the funniest questions I've been asked as of late? Yesterday, I'm doing my, my podcast out of Pittsburgh, and somebody asked me the question, man, and I'm laughing right now saying it. Hey, have you heard conversation that Pitt is going to join the SEC? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> like Pitt Panthers. And I went, ha! I said, what? Say what? Like Kyle Pitts, is he going to go back <laughs> yeah. for his degree at Florida? <laughs> that, he's got more of a chance of finding another year of eligibility than Pittsburgh does. Now they started calling out my laugh, and I had to clean it up just a little bit. Really? But I said, no. I said, respectfully, man, Pitt beat us in Knoxville and Kenny Pickett and all that type of stuff. I said, but Pitt making it. I was like, let's try getting a, 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 a stadium on campus first. True. Okay, let's, let's, try about, let's try building up your fan base. I can't lie. They've had a bunch of first-rounders that's come out of them. Larry Fitzgerald is a bona fide first ballot. Yeah. Aaron Donald is a walking cold jacket. LaShawn McCoy, they got player after player after player. But, but as a whole. Coming to the SEC? Yeah. Nah. You're better off trying to go to the Big 12 or something like that. I laugh. That ain't going to work. That's got to be one of the funniest sports questions I've been asked. Let's go to Micah in Nolansville real quick. What's up, Micah? What's up, Micah? Hey, so I was uh, I heard the conversation earlier on favorite play by play. Yeah. The best play by play announcers in the in MLS soccer is Lucas Panzica and Will Bowling. Hey. Whoa. Hey. Your checks in the mail, Micah. So I had a question also. We're SEC champions now and I think they're gonna probably play the starters, but I wanted to ask you guys, do you think the Vols or if you're Rick Barnes do you play your starters on Saturday? Because you, it's senior night. Dalton Connect is Kentucky's daddy. And, but then you're running the risk of, all right, you got the SEC tournament. You got the NCAA tournament coming up. We might give them a rest since they played three hard games in a row. So if you're Rick Barnes, what are you doing in this situ- situation? Do you play the starters or do you not? Thank you, Micah. Thank you, Micah. Tennessee Micah it down. needs a one seed. Yes. And in order to get a one seed, they would like to win tomorrow. So they're going to play everybody, and they're going to go for it. This isn't should. the NBA. Right, 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 right. Um, I look at it, too. Depending on how they go with the starting lineup, if they go with all seniors, who else is left in the senior class? You might get off the hook. Colin Coyne. So they usually start the seniors. Uh, they usually don't. but <laughs> I mean, but in a situation like this, last hoorah, I say Maybe win, lose, a in. draw, I think it's going to be a great show. Yeah. Kentucky, again, uh, we heard Hub say that earlier. They can get hot and make a Final Four run. Like, yeah. they're that good and, and, and talented when it comes down to what they're capable of. Um, but I see them trying to cap this one off. It's senior night. I think they somewhat owe Kentucky. I can't. Kentucky. I think they owe Kentucky. <laughs> sweep them. Uh, sweep them in when you can. You, you're 100% correct. I tell anybody in, this, in, the, in the world of competition, if you can put your, your your foot on somebody's neck, do it. Because if mm-hmm. the shoe was on the other foot, they would too. What do you remember the most about your senior day, Ramon Foster? I know that was a terrible year. kind of a chaotic day <laughs> because that was about a lot more than just seniors. It was the last two off for Philip Fulmer. It was... Coach Fulmer's last game as Tennessee's head coach, and you carried him off the field afterwards. But from just the senior part of it, outside of the Fulmer aspect, what do you remember the most? The last tackle in that Friday practice. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing older guys doing that. And my freshman year, I was like, oh, what is this? And then, like, sophomore, junior year, I was like, come on, man, get this over with. Get these old dudes up out of here, okay? And when it was my turn, man, it was, okay, am I going to trip and fall running down? So what we do, if I'm explaining this like y'all know what it is. They line up the entire team, and they have a tackling dummy with a helmet. I think it was Kentucky or somebody's helmet. Kentucky. Kentucky. Oh, why do I keep dropping that? That's wrong? okay. Uh, but they put a helmet on top of it, and you run down. Coach say some words 
about you and in front of your teammates you're acknowledged on senior day. That was probably one of the cooler moments because this is like this is my last day of practicing on this field. Yep. Um, so that was super cool. Wasn't emotional. I'm not a super emotional person. But coming out of uh, the tunnel at, at Neyland, I remember having a flower for my mom, kissing her, seeing Coach Fulmer down the middle of it, big hug running through, and uh, it was like, let's go win. That was a real cool moment, man, for the ones that get the experience going out as seniors. Uh, it's necessary. I was a person that didn't want to really do that in the beginning, and I did, and I loved it. I was also another person that didn't want to walk across the stage for my college degree. Now, I forget my mom and my mother-in-law. I was like, boy, if you don't walk your butt across that dog on <laughs> stage, like, it was those type of moments. You you really, sat, like, take on those moments big time. I uh, Emotional, Will, it was in hindsight, looking back at it. Um, and I'm a former guy through and through. Mm -hmm. I think it's rare now, too, especially in this day and age of whether it be football, basketball, like a lot of these guys aren't here the full time. And I think specifically for Tennessee basketball, they have had some players that have really built a name and built a fanfare at the university. And I think that's special and unique in this day and age because you don't get that in the one and done or the transfer portal era. So... If you have an opportunity, too, as a fan base to thank these guys that have really spent a lot of time here, I think that's special, too, in this particular situation. And that's why I will say, to that point right there, we ended up uh, getting tickets to that. If my kids are listening, they probably were like, oh, damn, we're going to. Yeah, we're Oh, they don't know? Uh, I don't think so. Oh. Uh, but this just in. This just yeah, right. <laughs> Breaking news. <laughs> and the baseball game, too. But oh. this, um, this group, Santi. And, and Josiah, and even seeing what Dalton Connects turned into, to witness that one, I, I'm an actual fan now. So mm -hmm. this is kind of cool for me to see them dudes come in and, yeah. and uh, be grown men now. It's cool. And you'll see the pyro. pyro I hope so. I pyro hope they stuff, got fire. Show, whatever yeah. it is, yeah. I hope. In person. Always. I'm not going to lie to y'all. I'm ready for Josiah Jordan James to move on simply because every time y'all <laughs> say his name, I think we're talking about the former producer of the show. Oh, Josiah. Oh, Justice. <laughs> yeah. JC. Jamaclin's not going to get any more talk. I thought it was I'm Jaheen. done with it. it ain't He's Jaheen. got so many names. I actually saw Jarvis last night at the Nashville SC game. You did. Oh. And then I talked to him, and it took so long to get back to my seat, I missed Jacob Schaffelberg's second goal in the 47th minute against Inter Miami. Classic Jehoshaphat. That's I know. Jehoshaphat. Judas. I mean, Justin yeah. really did kind of. Kind of hurt my ability to see it. He, he he saw the second goal because I went to his section. We did right. not meet halfway. He he benefited from that whole conversation. Way to go, Judas! The friend. best producer in the world. In the world. In the world I've heard that in so long. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about Bert now. <laughs> right. That's right. I'm the captain now. <laughs> yes. That's right. Rustin Walsh. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five. Coming up next. How close are we to a two league super league? In a couple of conferences in college football, Andy Staples of On3 joins us next. It's Ramon Foster for United Structural Systems, man. And if you're driving or at home looking outside the windows or in your office looking outside the windows, you can tell it's raining. With this rain, and we, we, we see an influx of uh, water-related calls, okay? And the ground is currently expanding now, currently as it's raining, it gets saturated. And at time, it's picking up volume in the ground as far as the amount of water up against your house. And that may cause your basement walls to bow. That may cause some foundation issues around your home, too. The rain will slow down into the concrete, which also leads to the cracking. Water permeates or penetrates a lot of things. You don't realize that. And it can cause your house to sink. It can cause flooding and, and water going over the walls and whatnot. And I'm here to tell you, if you need your, high t your house taken care of, uh, you got to reach out to United Structural System for foundation and waterproofing issues. They will make sure you're took care of, and they will stop all things, not just then, but down the line, too. And the warranties are some of the best in the industry. If you have issues around your house with waterproofing and foundation, they are serving Middle Tennessee, Southern Kentucky, and Western Kentucky. You can reach out to United Structural Systems at USSTN.com or call them, 615 488 
RKW, Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed by 8th and Rose to 104.5 The Zone. Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Will Bowling. You heard from Brent Hubs of VolQuest and on three in the previous hour of the program. Now we bring in our very good friend Andy Staples of on three talking some college football this morning. We are all in on on three, Andy. What's going on? I appreciate that. I, I mean, you already had Brent Hubs on. He's royalty, so I don't, I don't know that I can add much to, to what he said. Well, Andy, I, I want you to know that for our listeners that watch our stream and see me distracted sometimes, I am watching the live stream of Andy Staples on three, oftentimes with the closed captioning, just to, you know, surmise anything that I can. So uh, I, I'm multitasking as much as I can and supporting you guys. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So hopefully you got a chance to see Jed Fish, the new yeah. Washington coach on today's show. We got, uh, we got Brent Venables coming up on Monday. And uh, it, it's, it's been interesting checking in with some of these guys. Uh, you know, Jed Fish is, in a, is such a wild situation because he's taking over a team that played for the national title two months ago. He's only going to have two starters back from that team. So it's going to look completely different. And, oh, by the way, they're in the Big Ten now. A little different, absolutely. Um, Andy, I know um, Brent brought this up earlier this morning about helmet communication and Josh Heupel specifically. I know J.D. Piquel of On3 talked to Josh Heupel this week as well, and you guys have had a ton of conversations with Power 5 head coaches this week. How much of an impact do you think – helmet communication has on tempo offenses like Tennessee? It's unclear because we, I was talking about this with somebody the other day. I'm trying to figure out how well you're going to be able to hear on the road with those things because, you know, they've used it in the NFL since 1994, but they're only, and, and Ramon, you can probably speak to this better than I can, there are only a few NFL stadiums that rival like an SEC or a Big Ten stadium in terms of noise, like Seattle does, Kansas City does, New Orleans does. But most places, it's not that loud. When you get into Neyland Stadium or you get into Bryant-Denny Stadium or Tiger Stadium or, or uh, you know, Happy Valley, like when you're in those places, it's deafening. So the question is, will you be able to hear or will you have to just signal the way you always did on the road? And I think also there's so much kind of check with me going on in college football where, you know, they're not huddling. Like the NFL, they still have a lot of huddles. So coach will tell the player what's going on. Player will tell the other team and tell the rest of the team, here's the play. In this case, most colleges probably still aren't huddling. So you've got to communicate things. And when you've got to communicate out to your receivers or to your cornerbacks when they're on the field, if you only have one person with a green dot helmet, it's not going to be time effective to have that person tell everybody what's going on. You're still going to have to signal those other players somehow. But, Andy, this is so much like the NFL, though, with this approach. And, and with all things said, I love what the Rock is trying to do with this spring league. But is college football more ready to, to be a, a farm league for the NFL with these type of movements? Of course, like two-minute warning essentially is in college football. Like, are we there, essentially? Well, it's always been a farm league for the NFL. It's been that way for 100 years. So, I mean, that that's not really the, the thing is – is it becoming too much like the NFL? I, I'll push back on that because I, I hear people say that all the time. Like, oh, I'm not going to watch it if it's too much. Like, that, no, you, you are going to watch it because we see the NFL's numbers and we see college football's numbers. Basically, everybody who watches college football watches the NFL. So it's not like you're going to be so shocked by it. And it may be that the NFL does these things better, and that's why people are adopting them. So I think the two-minute warning was, was kind of a give back. Because coaches were used to that, you know, more clock stoppages before because you used to stop the clock when you went out of bounds. And now you don't stop the clock when you go out of bounds until the last two minutes. So they ended up actually with less st- clock stoppages than the NFL. And I know some coaches last year said it felt like the, the end of the game situations would, would get away from them because it would go so fast. So now this gives them that extra clock stoppage back. So I – I, I don't really have a problem with it looking more like the NFL. The NFL is the most popular sport in America for a reason. The separator, I think, between the two, um, at least in the in the uh, in, in the, uh, the, the the reports that came out from the NFLPA, is facilities. I see you had some conversations yeah. down in <laughs> Ole Miss. Colleges are way better. Yeah, college is way better. But it, I saw where you said where it was reported that NIL is actually getting in the way of stadium renovations. Andy, why is that such a big thing? Well, 
because colleges have been wasting and stadium renovation is a little different story because stadium and facility are, are and, and football facility are two different things. The stadium is the thing you use seven times a year that your fans sit in. The facility is where your players are every day. And they've wasted a lot of money on weight rooms and football facilities. Like they don't need to be as nice as they are. They don't, they don't need to be torn down and rebuilt every two years. They had to spend the money on something because they couldn't give it to the players. So that's why college facilities are so much nicer than NFL facilities. Because in the NFL, they just give you money. And it's like, okay, that sounds good. Now, NFL teams are figuring out if we want to attract good free agents, having nice facilities helps. And so the Cowboys have a nice facility that the Chiefs apparently don't. But that hasn't stopped the Chiefs from winning Super Bowls. Uh, but as far as the stadium stuff goes, that's a different story. And you heard Ole Miss's AD Keith Carter talking about this the other day. They had a stadium renovation project that they were going to, to work on when NIL became legal. And they've since tabled it because they realize what you should realize. The best way to improve a stadium is by putting better players in. Andy Staples of On3 joining us today on RK Dub. So, Andy, speaking of uh, your show and excellent show that you do, you talk to so many coaches. That includes a guy that we all know and talk about a ton down here in SEC country and Lane Kiffin. Um, when you're talking with some of these coaches, what's the main thing that you're getting out of the new world of NIL, the transfer portal? Are these coaches just accepting it at this point or are they just, you know, okay with it? Well, it's, it's sort of like what Lane said. Lane said you can complain about it all you want, but you actually, if you're not willing to, there's two levels of it. You can say, I don't like this, but I'm willing to adapt to it. Or you can say, I don't like this. I'm going to pretend it's not happening and hope it, hope it goes away. And if you're the second group, you're going to be fired, basically. And that's what Lane said. He's like, you're going to get fired and your team's going to stink. And he's right. He's right. The, this is happening. It's not going back. They're never going to go back to the way it used to be. So the coaches have, have better get used to this. They can not like it all they want. They can say they don't like it all they want but they better have a way to handle it. And you've seen the guys that, that can handle it the best. I'd say Lane Kiffin and, and Mike Norvell from Florida State, probably the two best at it. But Kirby Smart, I mean, he, he's the best coach in college football right now, and you don't hear Kirby complaining that much. Because Kirby's thing is, look, I'm in my 40s still. i got to do this for a lot longer. If I complain about this, like the, the system's going to change three more times before I retire, so why do I care? So we've got a new package for the Fox Friday night. Um, no, it's not Pac-12 after dark because the Pac-12 does not exist. But um, this <laughs> will feature the Big Ten, the Big 12, and Mountain West games. But you said this specifically really good for the Big 12. I hope they pick a lot of Big 12 games, especially in November, because that league is going to be so balanced and those teams are going to be so close together. They're going to have like four games each week where if you pick, you can kind of pick between any of them, and they'll have playoff implications, and they will probably be a close game that's going to come down to the wire. Like, that's the kind of game you want. Like, it, it, the Friday night game, you just, want, you just want something fun that everybody wants to just tune into, and it's close, and, you know, everybody who's on Twitter at the same time loves watching it together. All the gamblers are like, oh, I'm going to put a little extra on this. And that. That's what you want in a Friday night game. And so I think those big 12 games – would be perfect for that because, you know, the, the really big Big Ten programs, they're getting plenty of shine on Saturday. Uh, in the Big 12, the best game each week is going to get a nice time slot. But when you get down to the second, third, fourth best games of, that, uh, of the week in the Big 12, they're not going to have the best Saturday time slot. They're going to be up against some monster from the SEC of the Big Ten. You put that game on primetime Friday night, everybody in the country's watching it. Andy, how close are we right now to a two-conference Super League? I enjoyed your piece about this on On3 earlier this week, but as expanded playoffs become a bigger topic of conversation, are we closer to that being a reality than maybe some people think? Yeah, but I don't think it has to do with the playoff. I think a playoff is a symptom of that. Sure. I think it has more to do with just how college sports are going to be organized in the future and how college football specifically is going to be organized in the future. We don't yet know the answer to that, but there are court cases, there are National Labor Relations Board decisions to be made that are going to get made here in the next couple of years. They're going to basically determine that. 
And it's not an accident that the Big Ten and the SEC commissioners have decided to work together. Like, they're, they're probably the most similar leagues. And I don't think they're doing this with a plan. It's not like a hollowed-out volcano thing, the plan to take over. But they may wind up taking over anyway because that just may be how it works. And, and the question would be, you know, do they just gobble up some more and they become major college football? Or does it stay where there's four power conferences? And I, I think it's more likely that either the two gobble them up or schools individually decide, you know what, we just need to form our own league and, and govern it the way we want to govern it. And they, that would be – because everybody asks, like, well, is the SEC going to kick out Vanderbilt or is the Big Ten going to kick out Indiana? No, they're not. Like, that's not going to happen. But if Ohio State and Alabama and Michigan and Tennessee all got together and were like, hey, we're going to do our own thing, then it's a totally different scenario. Then it's just who moves the meter. It's interesting, Andy. You write about the moonshine division on on three of Alabama, Auburn, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Virginia Tech. If Greg Sankey doesn't end up becoming the commissioner, quote-unquote, of college football, (laughs) will you please do it to make the moonshine division a reality? I I am all for it. I mean, that would be awesome. I think the two Alabama schools are a little misplaced there, but I needed it. I I wanted to put them somewhere and have Alabama and Auburn be a division game if I could and keep the 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 divisions competitively balanced in this this fictional 48-team Super League. Uh, But, yes, if you have West Virginia, Virginia Tech, Tennessee, and Kentucky in the same division, it has to be called the Moonshine Division. There's no other name for it. There's absolutely no other way around that one, 100%, man. Uh, Andy, I I saw the tweet, man, from uh, as as far as Michigan's concerned. They have hired a general manager for a college football team, um, Sean McGee is their general manager now who will handle the identification, evaluation, recruitment. It seems everything will be handled before the head coach has to assess anything. Is this where we are right now? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is not new. The team's been doing this for years. You know, back when Butch Jones was at Tennessee, he hired Bob Welton away from the Packers. And Bob worked for Alabama under Nick Saban, still works for Alabama now. Like, this is, this is not a new thing. But what is new and, and what people have – ratcheted up is you know they they realize that an nfl style of personnel management might work better but with nil and the transfer portal they realize the the pro player personnel side had to be beefed up so if you're like ramon you you always understand this you play the nfl like the scouting department has two sides the, the college scouting department that looks at the players that are now in college and the pro player side that looks at all the other teams in the NFL to figure out who you want to sign as a free agent, who you might want to pick up if they get cut by another team. Like if you need to, if you need a safety this week, like who's on the market. And so college teams have realized that this is the smart way to handle it, where you've got one side of the, of the department that is recruiting the high school players, scouting the high school players. And then one side that is scouting the rest of college football. So that if some guy enters the transfer portal, you've already got a dossier on him and you could decide very quickly, is this someone we want or someone we don't want? So we all know that egos are real in the world of coaching, and we run into it every day. But I feel like in this world of college football, sometimes like you have to realize it, you just can't have it as much. I, I look at Chip Kelly specifically, and for him to walk away from UCLA, and I know there's a lot of stuff that was going on there would not benefit him. But to go to Ohio State as the offensive coordinator now, it, do you see that changing too, just how coaches are approaching where they're going next now because of this new age? I think it would require someone to think like Chip Kelly, and there's not that many people like that. <laughs> then, Because Chip has never been doing this to be – a bazillionaire. He's never done it to be a, a, a big shot. He likes football. He likes the X's and O's part of it. He likes coaching football. He hates the other parts of it. I mean, even before all this stuff happened, like when he had a chance to decide between the Florida job and the UCLA job, he took the UCLA job because you're required to recruit differently at Florida than you are at UCLA. And he didn't want to do that. So he made the decision that he'd be much happier just coaching football and at Ohio state. Yeah. You have to recruit as the OC, but not as much as you do. If you're the head coach, you don't have to deal with a lot of the other BS that you would have to deal with as a head coach. So he could take the pay cut and it didn't bother him. 
and his ego isn't going to be, you know, out of control and, and, oh, I have to be the head coach. He's gotten rid of the parts of the job that he hates and gets to do the parts of the job that he loves. So that's, that's why he did that. But I don't think most coaches think like Chip Kelly. So I don't know that you're going to get a lot of that. Andy Staples of On3, our guest here on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. Andy, it's always funny when people interact with Vol Twitter for the first time <laughs> online. Are, yeah. are, is the internet ready for Tennessee to maybe win a national championship in a major sport in men's basketball? Whew. No. <laughs> <laughs> because Vol Twitter is, a, is, an, is an interesting animal, and, and I've stayed on those guys' good side most of the time. But I've, you know, I've gotten on their bad side before. And it doesn't matter – how much they've loved you before you say one wrong thing and you're dead to them. And it is. Yeah. My friend, Andrew Perloff got, got destroyed the other day. Uh, I forget exactly what, what he said. Cause he, he said he was going to root for Tennessee and then he yeah. pulled it back. And, uh, and, and then ball Twitter got very mad about him about that. But you know, it's, it's interesting because that like Tennessee's basketball team is pretty lovable. Like <laughs> they're, it's, we talk like this entire interview we've talked about NIL transfer portal all the all the things where you know people just sort of move on and or, or go get the biggest bag. Meanwhile, you've got this team where yes, Dalton Connect is new and they got him through the transfer portal. And that's obviously been the biggest addition. But like the Kai Ziegler, Josiah Jordan James, uh, Santiago Vescovi, like all those guys have been there forever. Yeah. It feels like they've been there since Bruce Pearl coached. <laughs> like it's I, it, it's crazy to see a team that has a college basketball team that feels like it's been together for four years, and so they're actually a very lovable group, and they play good defense. Andy, I've also been attacked by Vol Twitter. Okay, <laughs> I just need you to know. Oh, no. I know. I, they don't even care if you play. <laughs> Me too. No, I, like I shouted out my on my Sunday night intro, Sunday night football intros, right? Ripley High School. Oh. Why yeah. is he not representing the University <laughs> yeah. of Tennessee? I think I probably angri- angrily right? tweeted at you with that. I probably would have been mad, too. Okay, Ramon, let me, let me ask you about that, because that drives me nuts, too, because, like, you played for the Steelers. You're on prime time a lot. So you've said University of Tennessee a bunch of times. Like, why not give your, your high school or your Pop Warner program a shout-out? And, and that's what it is. Like, the University of Tennessee is going to be fine. And everybody know I played at Tennessee, too, right? But then you just and, – and I'm like, it's about the state. It's not like I'm from, like, Alaska and I'm saying that. Like, no, this is a Tennessee town, okay? Ripley yeah. High School. And Andy, you want to talk about – you don't love the University of Tennessee. <laughs> I'm like, you guys know I broke my thumb in a pregame, got it casted up, and went out – and play the game after the game had surgery and still made it to the bowl game. Like they don't care about that though, Andy. They don't care about that. No, no, God, you, you, you better. Yeah, you now. Can you say? I because I'm not sure how how many seconds you get when they record those things. Like, could you say? You know, I'm a VFL. <laughs> but also represent. Yeah, and that's what, like that's the only way you can satisfy them. I, right. I, I wish I could have, and as soon as I get into my old account, I'm going to find those tweets <laughs> where I was replying back to people, okay? Outstanding. That's great. Andy Staples of On3, our guest. We know you all have two screens. Stream him 7 o'clock Central Please. Time, Monday through Friday, and, and have us on the other screen as well. Andy, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely. There's Andy Staples with us. Uh, we'll react to some of that. Uh, take a look at one player who the Titans – had interest in who is headed elsewhere in NFL free agency next.
Friday morning on Ramon, Kayla, and Will RKW is brewed by 8th and Rose. 615-737-1045, our number. There is some Russell Wilson news that has broken in the last four minutes. What? Ugh. Some news rustling up. This is a very real tweet. In real words, I'm going to read word for word from Ian Rappaport. Free agent quarterback Russell Wilson, who has permission to visit teams now, was spotted this morning at a Newark airport catching a flight to Pittsburgh to meet with the Steelers, said a source who saw him take pics and hang out with fans before boarding the flight. Russ is out here flying commercial? Go off, dude. Oh, he's trying to set a new uh, standard there. Right Southwest Airlines. Let's ride. Right? <laughs> or it's a deal. That's Delta. what I was going to say. Yeah, or he's got a deal. a deal. Let's like ride. That. Uh, yes, that, that was somewhat that was uh, reported yesterday by an house Stiller guy, too, that he was on his way to Pittsburgh. They agreed to have a conversation with one another. The thing that's attractive about Russ is Russ has somewhat agreed to um, pl- basically play for a million dollars. Yeah. Cheap. I mean, he's getting, I think, uh, $37 million or something like that from uh, Denver sure. just to leave town, which is can be considered a red flag. I don't know what happened in Denver. But, yes, that is very real as far as Russell uh, being in consideration. So, can Steelers. I ask you, is that a fit at all there? Like, I, and I, I know the guy can mm-hmm. still play football. I don't yeah. think he's completely done. I will say that. I'm a hater, but I will say I think he has football <laughs> left in him. Yeah. I just always wonder the fit now because that seems to be – the issue with Russell Wilson is the head coach and him always butt heads, I feel like, because he's his own entity. Mike Tomlin will not allow that crap. So that's where it goes into play for a guy like him. Um, Russ is going to go to a city that has nothing to do but play football. Mm-hmm. And that's essentially what he's going to have to commit himself to. And this is his third time around with a different team. So uh, he's got to have a little bit of humbleness about him moving forward. Uh, can it fit? Yeah, you always will. And everybody's going to always knock on the door of these type of quarterbacks. And uh, so I'm going to make an excuse, so at least I will say this too. I don't know what's going to – I didn't know if uh, Sean Payton liked him. So whatever happened in Denver may have been a mismanagement of personalities or something. 26-year-old Chooks Okorafor signed a contract with the New England Patriots yesterday. Player who has played all over the place. He can be a guard. He can be a right tackle was a starting tackle for the Pittsburgh Steelers last season until midway through the year when he was benched in favor of first-round pick Broderick Jones. We understand that the Titans had interest in Chooks Core 4. Ramon Foster, a former Pittsburgh Steeler now going to New England. This is a player the Titans had very genuine interest in who signs a one-year deal with the New England Patriots. And we know this because I talked to Chooks. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, when he came into town... Um... Um, I, I knew he was here, and there was strong conversation and consideration for a guy like him, too. I personally have told him I thought it would have been a great fit for him to be here with Bill Callahan, considering how Chooks was benched last year. He said something that during the course of the game that coaches didn't like that. So to come play and learn from a respectable offensive line coach like Bill Callahan, I think it would have been very advantageous for a guy like him. Um, he's super talented. Uh, I know I'm correct. Really, a tackle only, probably left or right tackle. Okay. Yeah, no guard for him. He'd probably look at you side. There you go. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, but I, I, I've known Chook since 2008 when he came in as a third rounder. Uh, I ain't played next to him. I had some reps against him and stuff like that. But the dude can play. He's young as heck and got a lot of years left in front of him. He's on a one year tra- I mean, one year uh, career rehab. Um, he's doing a one year with. The Patriots, uh, from my understanding, uh, and he also had a deal on the table here in our conversation. Also, I think he ended up may have taken a um, more money somewhere yeah. else. Is the way it breaks down to me. And here's the thing behind that too is you got to also probably tip your hat to Rand, considering I think what the Patriots will end up eventually paying him, um, with the idea that this is a deep tackle class you will have options in free agency and you're also at a point to where you're not going to overpay the mark what the market suggests on the player i think that's where this this franchise has been snake bidden in years past you're overpaying for players that you get nothing out of and not to say that you weren't going to get anything out of chooks but you look at this situation and say to yourself well we have now a baseline of what we will and will not do and you got to tip your hat to Rand and his group for uh, living up to that so far. And that's why I'm so interested to see what happens in this 
free agency round that starts up on Monday because we have heard from Rand about being smart with the money they have because they know they've got buco bucks, right? Yep. But it's how you spend it. And it doesn't mean just because a guy's out there with a the name, you're going to go throw a bucket of money at him. Exactly. And we've seen a little bit from Rand last year in dipping his toes in. Now, they didn't have any money in that case, so they had to bargain shop. But I feel like it'll be a happy medium with how they do that with free Facts. agency. Please credit at the Ramon Foster. The Titans had genuine interest in Chooks Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Now a former Steeler. Absolutely. Capital J when you talk about true. Ramon Foster. Mm. Coming up, fourth and final hour of the show, the 20th hour of the week. There was a spectacle in Nashville yesterday, and, well, Nashville deserved better when they hosted Lionel Messi for the second time. We'll talk about it next. Hey, it's Kayla Anderson for our good friends at Save a Tree. And we all know what a great job Dean Glasscock and his crew do there. Uh, just making sure that your trees and shrubs are in tip-top shape because we have had some winter storms. Uh, maybe you're thinking about now that we're reaching March and the weather is going to get warmer. Uh, how can you help your lawn care look well? Well, landscaping is a huge expense. It makes a huge impact on your yard. However, if not correctly maintained, those plants, those trees, those shrubs can die and or become a hazard to your home. Save a Tree can help with that. And their team of specialists are awesome when it comes to uh, customizing a full line of plant health care and pruning services that will make your landscape thrive. Almost everyone has a lawn care company helping you take care of your yard. So why not have a tree company that can take care of your trees and shrubs? Save a Tree can be that company to do it. Almost 30 years of experience. So give them a call, 615-299-9999, or simply log online to saveatree.com. That's S-A-V-A-T-R-E-E.com.
9 o'clock, 901 actually. Good morning and happy Friday from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. A couple of players signed yesterday ahead of free agency, most notably Patriots signing former Steelers offensive tackle Chooks Okorafor. The Rams also re-signing one of their own guard, Kevin Dodson, one of the better guards on the market, to a three-year $48 million deal. Dolphins signing former Titans tight end Jonu Smith, two years $10 million deal. And the fir- first franchise tag E signing a long-term extension, Jalen Johnson headed back to Chicago on a four-year $76 million deal. Averaging 19 a year is the ninth highest cornerback contract on average, which will look like a bargain as soon as these next cornerback contracts get done. And last night, Nashville SC and Inter-Miami ends in a 2-2 tie. The teams will meet Wednesday night in Miami for the second leg of the home-and-home portion of the round of 16, with Miami holding a decisive edge thanks to the away goals rule. Before the match, though, Nashville announced a contract extension with Hani Mukhtar, keeping him uh, in Nashville through 2026. Nashville also has an option for 2027 for the first uh, two-time All-Star, who's the club's all-time leader in goals, assists, and points. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5. The Zone. Final hour of the show and final hour of the week. Welcome into RKW, brewed by Eighth and Roast, Ramon, Kayla, and Will, Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Robert Walsh makes the show go. I'm Will Bowling. Coming up in 15 minutes, who do you not want to become a Tennessee Titan this offseason? 615-737-1045. We all know you want Ramon Foster to come out of retirement and slide himself <laughs> into that interior offensive line. But who do you not want to put on the two-tone blue? In the draft, in free agency, you can take it anywhere you want. Just tell us who you don't want. At 615-737-1045. We will do the same for you with our thoughts coming up in just about 15 minutes. It is Friday, ladies and gentlemen, and we have a motto, a creed, a pledge. To the good people of Nashville, Tennessee, and around the world watching on 104.5 The Zone TV, that when it is Friday, you should properly act like it. 104.5 The Zone AI, with the following announcement. It's Friday, and we're going to act like it as you listen to Ramon, Kayla, and Will with a song for the workers, a chance to pick up your bottle this afternoon, and grab a fresh pair of gaiters. Without further ado, Sir Charles Jones. This one is dedicated. Yeah. All the workers Come on, Bert. Work Come on, Kayla. Let's go. Work hey, you want a party? <laughs> that was beautiful harmonizing. <laughs> no, it was not. Nice. Don't lie to Bert. It was beautiful. That was terrible, but Bert. Bert, bring it. That's Come like, on, baby. There we go. It's a little raspy it in your voice. It is. We are. Is I'm not sure how long the rain's gonna be here, but hey, it's oh, Nashville it and right it's now? Friday. It's Nashville and it's yeah, it is. It's coming. It's coming down just a little bit. All day, baby. Embrace bit. it. I am. Um, I like it. Slow it down the day. Right. We are a nine to five that starts right now for many of you. It is just considering yeah. it is nine o'clock. Drive safe. Please drive safe, good people. As I went on my driver's tangent yesterday, you know what's crazy. What's that? It was a whole lot better yesterday, too. Oh, maybe people it were was. listening they in their cars. They were. They, they got they out of the left lane. Out. Eventually, we'll get there. We'll treat it like the Autobahn. <laughs> if you're in the left lane, you get a ticket. There should be Seriously, a lane just though. for you and Don Davenport to drive in. Yeah. I, no, it should be an uh, HLV lane, like a real one. Not that fake one that's on 40 where everybody say. drives <laughs> in. Don't get me started. That's not that. real. That's not a real. Have you done the Peach Pass before in Georgia? Uh, no, I have not. It's an elevated interstate that's, it goes one way. It's its own thing. And we go to enough, well, went to enough Braves games one summer that my parents were like, well, let's just do the Peach Pass. This looks fun. This is a club that we want to be a part of. And depending on the flow of traffic, they'll either have it go one way or the other. 
So sometimes you like try to go into Atlanta and it's closed because the traffic's coming from the other direction, but it goes beside the highway and it's like a little pass that you buy for a couple dollars and then it like scans you as you enter it. It's kind of fun. I don't think it really helps traffic at all, but it's cool. It's I, like have, you did it. I have ridden on it and GPS put me on it one day. I think we might've been going to a Braves game or something then or to a showcase or something in it in Georgia for baseball. Probably some yeah, kind baseball, of baseball I for the Foster say. family. Exactly. I for one am shocked. <laughs> exactly. But when you talk about the peach pass, like we didn't have a pass and we're just driving on. I'm like, okay, we're well, sending a ticket what to the happens? house. Nothing. We got on that thing and we beat traffic big time. There we go. It, 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 it's it's clutch, though, isn't it? Don Davenport has uh, texted all of us and says, damn right, get out of the way with five <laughs> exactly. exclamation points. People are real listening now. <laughs> yes, they're like, Babsy. They're out of the left lane. You may have went to Auburn, to Auburn, but we agree on some things, okay, in this traffic mm-hmm. in this city. It's fair. Last night, Nashville SC puts on a show against Lionel Messi and enter Miami on and off the pitch A 2-2 tie. Luis Suarez with a late equalizer. Jacob Schaffelberg with two goals. And once again, Lionel Messi got booed in the Music City. Every time he touched the ball, I loved every second of it. you got to get booed in some stadiums. Like, he doesn't get booed anywhere. At least do it here. Will proves my point right from early. They don't boo people who suck. (laughs) (laughs) There's nothing wrong with that, man. I'm not asking for it. When I say this stuff, I'm not asking for hate in sports. But the the friendly banter of booing somebody, awesome. Well, by the way, man, you're you're not being 100% truthful this morning either. Why's that? You're a little little ticked off by what happened in the stadium yesterday. Nashville got robbed. I don't want you to be. You're poking the bear. Yeah, I know. I don't want to poke the bear too much because I know Will has an obligation with his other duties over there. But, but. There are some issues that you have hold near and dear to your heart, man. If there was ever a robbery from bad officiating decisions, it was last night. Mm. Inter Miami should likely have had two red cards in the first half, at least one for a challenge on Jacob Schaffelberg, who scored two goals in this game, who he took a flying left elbow to the chin, was only given a yellow card. There are national, there are worldwide soccer people that are talking about how bad some of these decisions were that went against Nashville last night. In the first half, Drake Callender, Miami goalkeeper, took down Tyler Boyd in the penalty area while Nashville was already leading 1-0. There was not a penalty decision given on that play. Gary Smith postgame said, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm told that we had a pretty fair claim. I'm paraphrasing, but said that there was a decision that was made that went against us. It was tough. The, there are fine margins against a team like Luis Suarez and Sergio Busquets and, of course, the greatest of all time, Lionel Messi. Jordi Alba did not play for Miami, but Nashville looked amazing. They really did. They outscored Mocha 7-0 in the two legs uh, of CONCACAF Champions Cup in the previous round. And, man, when Jacob Schaffelberg scored five minutes into this game, that place went nuts. And then he scored with his weak foot in the 47th minute. Right foot, left corner of the box, top bins, in you go. Pick that one out, Drake Callender. It was it was awesome. And Na- then- Nashville should be very proud of what they put together on and off the field from the club to the fans and everything. It, it was a tremendous night. And the night started with Hani Mukhtar getting that extension. And I know that's huge for a lot of these fans because he's done so much here, you know, with starting this this club, which is not old by any means, and really having success from the start here. Um, He's been such a big part of it, just a face around Nashville. Uh, I think people just love watching him play because, damn, the guy can score. Mm -hmm. He's incredible. It it was a big deal for Hani, uh, who is the third player to ever have 50 goals and 30 assists in a three-year span in Major League Soccer. Third player to ever do that. You're talking about some outstanding players who have come through MLS either early in their careers or late in their careers. And to be only the third player to do anything in the history of this league is significant. But uh, Hani was great back from injury. Uh, His first time he's played since the first game of the season against Mocha FC uh, about two and a half weeks ago. Uh, He looked really good. Tyler Boyd, excellent. But Jacob Schaffelberg, man, that's the name to remember. Yeah. Uh, The Manitoba Messi. Doesn't he have, the like, no, a the Nova sh- mullet? Yeah, he does have a mullet they, <laughs> that is nicknamed the Tennessee Water Slide. Are you serious? That is the that is the real trademark That's nickname. That's awesome. The Tennessee Water Slide. Water he slide. is the Nova Scotia Neymar, the Manitoba Messi. That's good. He was tremendous last night. And uh, him and his 
wife Robin are expecting a kid as well. You said he had an announcement during the game. He did. Last uh, week, uh, he scored against Mocha FC, and he put the ball under his shirt, and he sucked his thumb, which is the sign of, like, hey, I'm like we're expecting. And then after the game, he was like, yeah, I didn't know when I was going to score again, so I figured I'd just go ahead and do it now. And then he went and scored twice against Messi in Miami. I'm telling right there. you, when you expect a baby, things happen. Like Philip Forsberg is expecting a youngin mm-hmm. uh, with his wife, Aaron. Um, and look at the season Philip's having. Yeah. Maybe it's a thing. Pretty good. 33 goals after a hat trick last night. Have a baby. But <laughs> Nashville, uh, Nashville looked great. You, you just can't count this team out ever. Yeah. No. They defend so well, and they have such dynamic attackers in transition and in counterattack situations. And they are, they were really fun to watch last night. That that was a, an excellent night in Nashville sports. And again, people around the world are taking notice of the way we are treating these superstars in soccer. Yeah. And by treating, I mean booing and making it hostile for them. And it was awesome. Sellout crowd. On a Thursday night with an 8 o'clock kickoff, I, I didn't know what to expect, candidly, with an 8 o'clock kickoff on a weeknight. It was tremendous, and there's a lot to like about this Nashville team. It is early in the season. That season's going to go through the middle of October, mm-hmm. literally, and you can hear Sunday's game right here on The Zone, one thirty pregame coverage with 2 o'clock kickoff. Myself and Lucas Panzica as they play LA Galaxy, but it is a marathon, and uh, they look good. Uh-oh. Good stuff. How many how many more hours you got to this one was put to bed as far as Well, it's tough because I mean they're on to LA Sunday and LA mm-hmm. is good. They're good too. LA yeah. is very good. LA uh the first team since twenty ten in MLS play to have twenty plus shots with forty percent or less possession of the ball in their one one draw with Miami two weeks ago. Where LA Galaxy probably should have beaten Lionel Messi and Inter Miami in Carson, California, and Lionel Messi scored in stoppage time to get a point, just like Luis Suarez did against Nashville last night. So uh, really good team coming in here on Sunday at Geodis Park and supposed to be a beautiful afternoon, actually. If people are uh, on the fence about what to do on a Sunday afternoon, yeah. you got a good start time, middle of the afternoon, beautiful day, sun will be shining. And it'll be a good time. The way that stadium set up, the breezeway is insanely good. Too. That's right. Oh, it's so natural cool. natural wind to come through there, too. They got yeah, those 100%. big old fans, too. Yeah, they do. Super cool. Empanadas is fire there, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, and the margaritas. Man. The, the margs are nice oh, there, too. Oh, hell yeah. I hate the fact that I'm calling them margs now. Well, it's part of our vocab now. Look, it's oh. it's hard being this right all the time, but I, I, I do it well. <laughs> I mean, you got to admit. When Brett Kern gave the okay, I was like, okay. Yeah. If Brett Kern is giving the okay, I'm okay. Yeah, that's what it was. Somebody in my age reign that made it okay. Yeah. It wasn't you. I can't give you that much credit. Thanks, Brett. <laughs> if you're out there listening, I appreciate you. Yeah, no, I appreciate no, your yeah. service. Coming up, who do you not want to be a Tennessee Titan this offseason? We'll give you our answers next. It's Ramon Foster for Secure Lawn, man. Before the spring kicks off and the weather gets uh, a little bit warmer and your grass and your yard start to grow, I'm telling you, you want to get them over there to provide their prime service. And you're probably wondering, what does prime service mean to you? Well, it means having their team members properly trained and prepared to provide a prime service, supplying you with the expectations that you need that will make you a lifelong customer. They are local. They have been serving service in Middle Tennessee for over 20 years. They're punctual. And you, you you also have to not sign no contract. What I'm telling you is if you don't like them, you can just end them. There is no attachment to them whatsoever. So as the weather starts to change, get Secure Lawn over to your house to spray some of their awesome sauce on your lawn to kill some of those pesky weeds so you can have the best lawn in the neighborhood like me, okay? Simply call them at 615-893-8455 or go to securelawn.com.
Rolling right along in your Friday morning edition of RKW, Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed by Eighth and Roast. Who do you not want to be a Titan this offseason? 615-737-1045. In the similar way that Coach Mack doesn't want Robert Walsh playing in the flat. Jeez. Who do you feel that way about? You can tell us. Want me to tee it up first? Uh, let's tee go it. first to the phones. All right. Oh, there we go. Let's go we to John to in the borough. First up, what's up, John? What's up, John? What's up, guys? Long time no talk. I know, man. Yeah. Good to hear from you. <clears throat> I move shifts at work, so I still get to listen to the show, but I get to work at 6 a.m. So, like, I'm pulling into the parking lot just as the show is coming on. Ah. Uh, but I still get to listen, and I still get to enjoy all the shenanigans. I miss you guys. Um <laughs> My, uh, just to catch you guys up real quick, Nola, my daughter, celebrated her second birthday yesterday. Nice. Happy birthday. Right. Papa Bear tour. So, um, so that's pretty much what's been going on. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, because you guys remember I'm a, I'm a Saints fan. Uh, Michael Thomas got released yesterday by the Saints, and uh, he, went, uh, he went ham on Twitter about it. Uh, he had some things to say. Uh, I loved it. I, I agreed with uh, Ralph Marbar, who's a, a local beat writer for the Saints, and said, put that man in the Saints Hall of Fame right now because he called Jeff Duncan out. Um, I loved that, every bit of it. Um, I would like to see Michael Thomas on, like, a one-year prove-it deal uh, with the Titans. I think that's a good fit. Um, I think if he can stay healthy, I think he can produce. Um but I wanted to know y'all's thoughts on that. And then I had a second question because all three of you are now members of the media. What do you guys think about teams using media members, like leaking them information to damage players and, and their, and their, their possible next move, like mm. the saints have used Jeff Duncan. Yeah. I wanted to know y'all's thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, because I like, I love that, that there are specific media members that have relationships with players and teams and all that, but I have a huge problem with the team doing that to hurt a player in the future. Can I start on that? Thanks, John. I, I am Appreciate very passionate about that. With over 17 years of experience in this business, building relationship with teams, coaches, and players, that is my biggest thing. Like, I don't care if you like the player or not. If it's not true – you're not, you should not be getting messy with it and trying to put things out there that are going to cause some sort of a stirrup like that. Like, that's just, to me, and I know not everything is about journalism in radio, but for me, that is still a big part of it. Like, those relationships mean something, and it's a small world in the world of sports. And it takes one person to say, oh, yeah, that person, not good at what they do because yeah. this is, so I am very adamant on that. Like, I don't mess with that stuff thing that sucks about it though is people have those reports and say what they want to and then people forget that they said those things sure you know that that's what's so messed up about it it, it takes people in that professional people out you know putting them on the outside looking in as opposed to just acting like it never happened to me i'm, I'm with you it there's happens. a lot of guys out there and gals out there that do this still that are known commodities that Continue to put these things out there they just got to meet the right person that right they're talking about mm-hmm. and and then i guarantee it changes then I mean, that's, yeah, I don't love it. I think it's it's been a part of the business for a long time. If that's what you want to do, do it. I'm not doing it, though. I, I think there are some times where reporters in gaining trust within certain facilities for the interest in gaining that trust maybe don't know that they're being manipulated mm-hmm. sometimes. I don't know if it's always intentional. And I'm not trying to... Uh, obviously call out anyone in Nashville. I don't think this is a Nashville thing at all, or I'm not, this is not a Titans topic. I think this is a league wide and just like industry wide thing that yes, there are probably people out there who will get something from a team executive or team official. And then in order to be a quote unquote mouthpiece, which is kind of a lazy term, but really be a mouthpiece, they'll put it out there for them. And for the sake of getting, more in return from that source in the future. But I do think there are some people that hear things and don't know that they're being lied to just to help that team. I think there are people genuinely trying to do the job that will put information out there that they are told and can source without knowing that they are being manipulated to help that team gain leverage with a player or coach. 
And I've seen a lot more of that lately, you know, in the media. I don't know what that's about, but I definitely have seen an influx of that. What do we think about Michael Thomas on a one-year deal for the Titans? In all respects, no. And look, Michael Thomas, hell of a player when he was healthy. But if you just look at his past three seasons with the Saints, I mean, the guy just has not been able to stay on the field. And rightfully, in the last three seasons, rightfully so, 10 games last year, that was his most that he's been able to be healthy. But just 448 yards, and and I get it, like, you know, things have changed since Drew Brees is not there, and and it's not been the the best offense um, for a guy like this. But... I just think at this point, we've seen the best of Michael Thomas, and unfortunately, it wasn't a lot. And look, I covered the kid in, at Ohio State. Incredible talent. And we saw it when he bursted into the league, but for some reason, he just he couldn't stay healthy, and then he couldn't build on his game throughout his career because of that. And was on a tear before the ankle injury and stuff like that. Um, it depends on the price for me with a guy like this. If he's coming in for minimum and he's going to play a specific role, um, I look at him now at 31 years old, is he blazing? He was never a fast guy, I don't think, to begin with anyway. If he's a move-the-chain type of guy, I like the idea of it because this offense is particularly young in a, in a good bit of places. And, again, we're speaking about right now um, – just trying to stack up the wide receiver room. Now, I'm not for just getting names because they are names, um, but I like what he could potentially bring in a role if at a cheap. good price. Yes. Yeah. Before we get to our players we want the Titans to avoid, let's give away some tickets, shall we? Ooh. We've got some Nashville SC tickets for this weekend. I was just talking about how beautiful of a day it is supposed to be on Sunday afternoon as Nashville Soccer Club hosts LA Galaxy this weekend. So uh, we've got your chance to win. Let's do it right now. There's no waiting, no no teasing. We're not going to string you along. We're going to do it right this second. Nashville Soccer Club is back in action at the Castle this Sunday. And your flagship station for NSC has your chance to win a family four-pack of tickets. Take the whole fam on a beautiful Sunday to see the boys in gold as they host LA Galaxy at Geodas Park. Be caller number five right now. Now, to win, thanks to our Window Nation ticket window at 615-737-1045. Family four-pack for NSC and LA Galaxy, which is going to be a doozy. I'm a poet, and I didn't know it. 615-737-1045. Who do we not want to be a Tennessee Titan this offseason? You said you were going to. Yeah, I lit it off. Okay. Uh, I got one guy in particular right now. I got a couple written down, actually three written down. This one in particular because the Titans need help, but I don't know if he's going to be the guy for you, and that's Jonah Williams out of Cincinnati. Okay. Um, Got pretty much pushed out of his position by Orlando Brown. It was funny. I was looking at an article. Orlando Brown called Jonah Williams the uh, MVP of training camp because he was willing to move over to the right tackle. No, that's called having yourself a duck. Okay, you you got to play left tackle because you convinced him to move over. The last couple of years, as far as his play has been concerned, hasn't been the greatest either. Um, comes out as a former first round draft pick, so there's some talent there. It's just that when you see a guy taking um, steps backwards the way he has the last couple of years on a really good. Okay, Cincinnati team. They've been fairly good over the years um, and the recent history. Seeing him in a position to where I'm forced to move over at a veteran and then on top of last year, according to PFF, uh, had uh, uh, how many sacks? Eight sacks given up. So it's not bad, but his running game and his passing game has been somewhat at the line, not excelling in it, just somewhat just getting by. So he's a guy that I would pass on, considering what you're probably going to also have to pay him. Um, if it's a dealer situation, what was it, three for 30, essentially, 10 a year? Um, it's serviceable, but how long are you committing to a guy like him also when you're trying to build from within? Only issue is I might end up having to eat my worst because Brian Callahan has a relationship right. with him. So there's that also. So that was your free agent, right? Yeah, that's okay. my free agent. I'll go on my free agent then, and we – Spoke about him briefly this week. And just being somebody who watched a lot of Seahawks games this past, you know, year, Mm -hmm. but particularly I've watched him since he arrived there. Um, Safety Jamal Adams is just, he's not it now. Like, I get he's a name, 
and I get the Titans need a safety. And look, there are a plethora of safeties out there, but he is a name that gets brought up because at one time he was a all pro guy. He's been a three time pro bowler. Um, but those days in my eyes are behind him. Um, this is a great talent and that's not to be denied from what he's done in his career. Cause I don't want to ever take that away from a player, but the injuries unfortunately have definitely derailed his career. Uh, he cannot get into a rhythm because of that in games. And therefore the production is just not there uh, in 10 games in his last two season guys, zero INTs. And he also went from setting the all time league record for sacks by a safety to absolutely zero over the last three seasons. Now, look, you can blame a little bit of that on Pete Carroll in the defense and maybe not utilizing him in blitz as much as you would like to or how you maybe should have mm -hmm. with the Jamal Adams. But when it's all said and done, availability is the best av uh, ability, guys. I've been so set on that, especially with this Titans team that has been derailed by injuries over the last couple of seasons. And I just don't think you can roll the dice on a guy that probably is going to be overpriced and is just injury prone at this point in his career. That's fair. It's interesting, the Denard Wilson connection. I, I wonder how much Denard Wilson will try to vouch for Jamal Adams on a one-year prove-it yeah, deal. it's fair to ask. I don't know. I'm going to say Derrick Henry. Yeah. I don't think the Titans should be interested in Derrick Henry coming back. I don't think Derrick Henry is interested, really interested in coming back to the Tennessee Titans. It's time to move on, guys. I know that Derrick Henry will always be loved in Nashville, as he should be. It is cool to have a superstar of that level embrace this city and embrace this market and fan base in the manner that he has. And I identify with that. And as a lifelong Titans fan, I will always love Derrick Henry for what he has contributed to this team. But we asked Sam Monson about it a few weeks ago. At what point should the Titans be in the market for Derek? And I disagree with Sam, who told us, I think they should absolutely be in the market. Make an offer, try to bring it back, see if he's interested. I still think that this offense would go back to Derek as a crutch when they felt like they had to. I know Mike Vrabel's not here anymore. I know Todd Downing, obviously, is long gone, and Tim Kelly, and it, it's a new regime, and I get that. But I think Tajay Spears is good enough for you to not have any interest in Derrick Henry coming back. And I don't think Derrick Henry, again, like I said, has any interest on his side as well. So I am ready to see a new style of Titans football. And I just feel like if they brought him back, the world would continue to revolve around Derrick. Because in that locker room, it has been, oh, God, somebody save us. Derrick, just carry us. Derrick, please. Derek, we need you. And I think Derek understands that. I think there's a certain element of ego within that. Not saying that Derek is a, a locker room problem. Not saying that he's a, a, a bad part of this locker room. I think he turned into an outstanding leader, including this past season. That being said, it's just time to move on. And I'm getting tired of the just continued ask of just like, well, what about Derek? Bring him back. Bring him back. Like, I, I am over it. I really am. I love the guy. I always will. I want him to be a Hall of Famer. I want him to have success at his next stop. I also want the Titans to be a 2024 offense and not a 2004 offense. And I think if they had Derrick Henry, they would revert back to it. This has, where he goes has no bearings on your emotional strings whatsoever either. I'm not a big cheer for a player when they leave guy. Okay. But it would be nice to see him win a ring. I'm not going to cheer for him in Baltimore. I can tell you that. That's fair. I think team allegiance should always be over cheering for a guy on your rival just to, so he can get a ring. Like, I, 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 I don't blame anybody for feeling on the other side of that, but I'd be happy for him if he won a championship, just not in Baltimore, not in the AFC South. Mm hmm. I uh I, I initially told you guys I was gonna say Bayard as far as my guy didn't yeah. want back. The easiest fix as far as safety uh, for the fan base would be the same things that you just said, retrading, going back to the same guys. And I think for the purpose of of moving forward as a franchise, um, you also have a new GM, you have a new head coach. There's a lot. I I think there will be a lot of change here. 
to where those guys will be celebrated because Miss Amy Adams Strunk will make sure they're celebrated. Derek will always have a home. Bayer will also always have a home. AJ situation is a little bit different. But the dudes has been here for that long and played the way they played and gave they all for this team here in Tennessee. They always have a place here. The same way Jarrell Casey was capable of coming back. But I I, I didn't want to pick buyers because, heck, there may be an opportunity there. He lives here or at least probably had a home here at some capacity, right? But there are different options out there. Changing teammates was hard for me at times. And then I somewhat did get numb to it. I did. That's just the way it goes. And fans, I think, are attached because you have those feel-good moments. But inside those locker rooms and when you talk to those players, there are conversations that are had sometimes where a player is like, I love this team, but I'm better off in another place because I'm either too comfortable here or in a situation where you say like a second ago, Will, with Derek. Break glass in case of an emergency is Derek Henry most times. Well, let me go be in a situation where I'm supported and I'm not just the main player in, a, in, in this game. And I same way I look at Byer's situation too. How does Imani grow as a leader, as a player, if everybody's going to look to Kevin Byer to save him in those situations? So that's where I was before we have a uptick in conversation about we'll bring back Byer. And I like him. Super cool dude. And there's other guys on that list that have been a staple here. And I'm not talking about the most productive guy, but somebody you always look to as maybe a blanket. I mean, NWIs in that conversation. Do you bring back an NWI, which people have split opinions on? Has he been reliable? Hell yeah, he's been reliable. Is he something that fits in this offense? I don't freaking know. But that's a that's a legit conversation you have to have. And it's almost like a comfort thing in some ways where It'd be good to have back a leader like that in the wide receiver room. But at the same time, do you just want to reset? So, Anyone in the draft you don't want? Kool-Aid McKinstry. Okay. Why is that? Period. Oh, okay. I, I just feel like he's one of those guys I loved in college. I, I thought, you know, this is a smart defensive player, first and foremost. I think he's a hell of a player um, when it comes to just the mind. But he's a guy that lacks speed. Um, he's a guy that I think at times he could be physical, but I don't think he's physical all the time in his play. And that's something that you have to have as a cornerback in the league, physicality all the time, especially on this defense that they're saying like that is going to be a part of it. Um, I think it's a little off and on for him. And then he just had the Jones fracture did not work out in the combine. I know that's not the end all be all you guys, but again, The Caleb Farley thing that happened in the draft with John Robinson and him rolling the dice on Caleb. I know this is not as big of an injury. I don't want any injury players that have been had something recently, period. Yeah. Uh, It was asked in our YouTube chat, too. That was a great point right there, Caleb, too, because that injury. But uh, Silly asked in the chat, do you have an example of an NFL player that was traded and then went back to the original team? Mm. Uh, Yes, I played with a guy, B.J. Finney, ended up trading to Seattle, came back to Pittsburgh eventually. Uh, there's another guy, Bobby Wagner, ended oh, up Wagner, going yeah. to the Rams and yep. made him place, made himself right back to Seattle also. So there's examples out there. Wagner did go back and have a monster season, but it is what it is. Didn't uh, your corner, former corner we have on the show all the time, you guys traded him to the Arizona Cardinals and then he came back to the Steelers a year later, sure I believe. Sure did. Yep, yep, yep. B-Mac, Brian McFadden mm. did also. There you there go. Are, I couldn't remember the there name. There are some. Mm-hmm. Brian McFadden. For there you sure. go. It happens. Yeah. 615-737-1045, our number. The draft guy I want to avoid quickly is Miami safety Cameron Kinchins. Fair. 2.11 relative athletic score out of a possible 10. Had a miserable combine. I know the combine's not everything. Ran a 4.65, tied for worst of all safeties. His 9-foot-2 broad jump was less than some offensive lineman. Yeah, he dipped low. The safety class is not the strongest this year. He is a total boomer bus player because if you mm-hmm. watch just yeah. his highlights, you see his incredible interceptions and and returns for touchdowns. But what you do not see on highlights is him missing tackles and blown coverages and the large plays that he gives up in the secondary. I want athleticism, speed. I think this off this defense as aggressive as as it is going to be under Denard Wilson. I don't know if he's a fit. Granted, I'm not a scout. I'm not somebody that can look at film and be very smart about it. I just talk into a microphone and drink coffee. But in my very uneducated opinion, I'm good on Cameron Kinchins. We're up at the show coming up next. Headlines on the way out. A look at Tennessee, Kentucky. Excuse me, Kentucky coming up tomorrow (laughs) as well. (laughs) 
It's Ramon Foster for Hill of Plumbing, Heating, Cooling, and Electrical. This month, man, is Happy's Golden Ticket Sweepstakes at Hiller, okay? You can enter to win at, at HillerGoldenTicket.com, man. And all you have to do is enter your email, and you're automatically entered to win. It's that simple. Prizes, though, they include a $5,000 Hiller gift card, a $1,000 a $1, Hiller gift card, or one of 10 Happy Hiller Club memberships, and that entails a whole lot of services and good things that keeps your home safe and simple and, and working properly, okay? Or you can take advantage of the zero interest financing for 48 months on select new HVAC systems or 36 months on tankless water heaters and whole home generators. Don't miss out. Enter to win now at HillerGoldenTicket.com.
Rolling into the weekend at RKW, brewed by 8th and Rose, Ramon, Kayla, and Will. Ramon Foster, Kayla Anderson, Will Bowling with you. Conference tournament basketball continuing over the weekend. And in its second season in the Atlantic Sun Conference, Austin Peay's going to play for an Atlantic Sun Championship after their win 77-71 last night against North Alabama. They will take on Stetson, the number two seed. Can anyone Stetson. tell me what Stetson's nickname is? Ooh. Anyone tell me what Stetson's nickname the is? Mustangs. I did know this one before I looked at this article. The Mustangs. This is one of my favorite nicknames in college basketball. The Bennetts? Oh, never mind. Nope. Stetson Bennett's? Did you get that? I did get it. Uh, oh, Stetson Bennett, <laughs> football player. I, did get it. I was lost on that one. Robert? Uh, I am uh, not comfortable enough giving a guess. <laughs> okay. Oh. I don't want to skew my record with giving a wrong guess. Anyone in the F and Bank chat on YouTube? What is Stetson's dick? Someone's just going to look it up. I'll just tell you. It's the Hatters. Hatters. Dude, I was going to say Stetson hats. No, you were not. I was because if you if you hear the song, you don't wear Stetson hats. You're a tramp. you like, dad gum it. That's where uh, oh, now Belmont God. coach Casey Alexander used to coach. How long have they been the Hatters? I think for a long time. Are I don't know. As long as I've hatters? known that they existed, they have been the Hatters. The Hatters. Okay. Where did this name come from? Where is Stetson located? It is Georgia. Located. No, Texas. He's in Florida. Texas. Central Florida. Ah. Uh, mm. Deland, Florida, wherever that is. Deland. Deland. Never heard of it. You don't know where Cleveland. Deland is? No. Cleveland. No, do not. Deland, that's what they call Cleveland. Deland. Deland. It is what they yeah. call Cleveland. And it is because the guy who started the college is the man who invented the Stetson hat, the Stetson look cowboy at, hat. Look at Bert. He's like, I just want to make sure this God, is right, I'm it. telling you, dude. <laughs> we're efforting that, too. Okay. Other Nashville hoops going on. Belmont taking on Northern Iowa in Arch Madness, the 5-4 matchup in the Missouri Valley Conference. Belmont taking down Valpo yesterday. 2.30 start for that one. And they split games throughout the season, too. This should be a good matchup. Yeah. I think uh, Belmont got them by 20, and then the second time around, I think they only got them by seven, if there I'm you go. not mistaken. Yep. Teresa Walker tweeted at us, by the way, and said the Hatters. The Hatters. She Look was at T. It. Of course no T knows that. Uh, she asks where the game is. I believe it is in DeLand, because since they are the higher seat, I believe that is how all of these things work. I think so. I think you're correct. At the Edmonds Center, where Austin P lost 83-82 in the regular season. Mm-hmm. That should be a good one. Should be a good one. Nice. Govs last played in the NCAA tournament in 2016 after winning the OVC tournament, losing to Kansas in the first round that year. Let's go pee. Let's go pee. <laughs> Let's go pee, baby. Tennessee, Kentucky tomorrow. Uh, Ramon, you are going to be in the building, right? I am going to be in the building, man. I'll see um, you there. I'm doing all this fan type stuff, man. I'm looking forward to seeing what this is going to look like. For Do you sure. got police that are going to escort you in? <laughs> well, uh, I'll be, I'm the one to police my family <laughs> through traffic. Uh, being, You're being, driving. Being tall has its benefits, and that's uh -huh. walking through uh, full arenas and stuff. Excuse me, pardon Good me. Point. You can see Ron Slay's picture. In the Food City Center at Thompson Bowling Arena. That's really cool. Nice. No. It's right by the section my dad and I sit in. Oh, for real? Mm-hmm. Cool. I'm looking forward to it. It should be a good time, man. Those dudes deserve to go out on top. Uh, I can't wait to see what this March Madness is going to look like. Either way, this has been a great season. As yeah. a fan, for myself to sit back and watch this, man, it's been real, real solid. Actually made me more of a basketball fan when your team get good like that. It does. Same way bandwagon fans jump on fo good football teams, right? But it's your team, so it yeah. can't be bandwagon. Yeah. But yeah. I get what you're saying. Yep, for sure. That's where I'm at with that one. Teresa Walker also tweets at the Ramon Foster, and says, Bridget Gordon, Lady of All Great, is from DeLand, Florida. Never heard of DeLand. And I believe her, 100%. Oh, yeah. Teresa knows her stuff. Oh, 100%. Mm -hmm. Never doubted it. Uh, to confirm that I was right on the Miami stuff, uh, Stu Holden, Fox Sports soccer commentator, just tweeted two minutes ago, ugly cheap shot here from Avilas of Inter-Miami. Stuff like this only adds fuel to the fire for opposing teams and will escalate aggression, etc. Enter Miami already have a target on their backs and get every team's best shot. Could get interesting. Love that. Ooh-wee. There are already teams that have I tried have. to go after Messi a little bit and try to bruise him and knock him over a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> Orlando. And uh, I don't know. I think, uh, I think that's going to get really interesting mm -hmm. to watch in the soccer world. And I know Messi kind of transcends just soccer and is just like a sporting icon because he's... Maybe the most famous person alive. 
Loki. Oh, well, I have that argument with my girlfriend all the time of who's more famous, Taylor Swift or Lionel Messi. It's not close, by the way. Yeah, it's really? not even close on that one. It's messy. Oh, that's all I, I feel like she's worldwide, too, though. Mm, I think you'd be surprised in, like, I have to choose my words carefully. No, I really don't. And just in every continent. Yeah. Like, I think Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift is obviously an icon, but Lionel Messi in countries where all you know is work mm-hmm. and soccer. Yeah. They don't, they don't listen to Taylor Swift. Right. If we're going off the the agreed upon metric of Instagram fame, followers. which is Instagram followers, yeah, of course. Uh, Taylor Swift has 282 million followers. Messi has 500. Wow. So yeah, almost 500. double that's the incredible. amount of followers. Correct. Yeah, that's significant. Yeah. <laughs> what did Ronaldo have? Didn't Ronaldo have He's a, got like a significant six, amount? 70, 670 million. Yeah. He's got abs, though. Messi doesn't have abs. Dude, I was going to say that's because yeah, he Ronaldo's thirst traps. He does. They're overrated. I mean, I don't think so. I did look at a guy in a Barcelona jersey <laughs> last night, and I looked at him and I said, hmm, Ronaldo would have scored in that first time. <laughs> yeah. Uh-oh. He was not happy with me. That's the show, and that is the Troll. week. The Buck Rising Show is up next. We will talk to you Monday as tampering and free agency. It's here, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go. We're going to celebrate a new league year next week here on the show, and Ramon Foster is going to give you words of wisdom right now. You must remember at all times, your Twitter fingers and your mic is always hot.